And we are so happy that we have had our st stakeholders key into this conference wholeheartedly. We can see the turnout this morning, very impressive. So we want to say thank you and welcome to this conference. We hope that at the end of the day, by the time our speakers and facilitators mount the podium to speak, all of us would take one or two things home because the whole essence of this gathering is for us to seek transformative ways to develop the Nigerian dairy sector. We are here because of the dairy sector. We are here because of milk. And if you agree with me, you know that milk is a very, very integral part of the of human diet. And that is why the United Nations has set aside the 1st of June every year for us to celebrate globally World Milk Day. We have all the challenges we have in the Nigerian dairy sector. Some of them we will look at today, but we will come up also with solutions and we will go back and do better as long as, as far as the industry is concerned. So I want you to sit and relax and have a very wonderful conference. Thank you so much once again for coming and God bless you. Put your hands together for him once again. It was very brief and straight to the point. I would like to recognize the presence of Dr. Onalo Akpa. He's the Director General, Poultry Association of Nigeria. Welcome, sir. Also, I would like to recognize Mr. Tabi Karikari, Chief Agriculture Officer, African Development Bank. If you're here, please just wave at us. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for him, please. Moving on to goodwill messages. First on that list is President Agriculture Correspondent Association of Nigeria, Mr. Oba Olasukomi. Please put your hands together for him as, make, as he makes his way to the podium. He's my yoga, by the way. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Is it that we've not taken enough milk? Uh, standing on the ZZ protocol, I want to first appreciate and uh, congratulate the organizers of this event. It's the 
the event is up and it's something that we should always be looking at. Looking at the statistic, Nigeria is one of the, have one of the highest uh, population of cattle in Africa. I don't know where the statistic come from. Nigeria is placed as number five, but I still believe that Nigeria is having more population of cattle, more than what we are seeing on the, on the FAO statistic anyway. And that being said, Nigeria is supposed to be one of the countries that will take a better advantage of uh, this sector by developing it uh, dowry sector and then also by investing more on milk production is uh, the sector is one of the most important in times of the potential the, the financial potential and uh, the potential in providing jobs creating empowerment and also in uh, adding more to the gdp of the country we, despite the huge cattle population, the statistic has, told, has showed us Nigeria only produces 40% of its dairy uh, milk, the, the milk needs, and 60% is being imported. Nigeria milk consumption per capita is said to be 8%. Instead of improving, we are seeing it declining, which is not speaking well of us. Even though the government is doing a whole lot, which uh, uh, Vice President giving us a whole lot of hope of infrastructural development and also investment in uh, infrastructure and then policy development. We have not seen the private sector taking the needed advantage of this sector. We see the private sector do trying on their own, but we think they can do more. The private sector can invest more, looking at the huge investment opportunity that is inherent in the sector. Private organizations such as uh, Freelance Capital and uh, some of the dairy uh, milk producers in Nigeria should engage in backward integration. I know some of them are doing it, but I think more still need to be done to ensure that we take advantage of the opportunities inherent in the world, which we're told that the sector is worth $1.5 billion, which I am very sure that, uh, no, I mean, the, the meek news, the meek, the meek news is over $1.5 uh, billion uh, tons, and yet Nigeria is only producing um, about just not up to 10% of the milk names. I think Nigeria should stay, the private sector should do more and take advantage of this sector. As journalists, our decision as Nigerian force before our profession, we believe that the sector, the sector should be projected better than it's been done now. And we have taken decision as an association that we will project the sector, we project the advantage instead of looking at the disadvantage of the sector, we would rather look at the, the, the advantage of the sector so that we can draw more investors into the sector because whatever we, produce, we, we project, we always rub off on us as Nigerians. So we have decided that our focus now will be on the development of the sector. So whatever you see coming from us is to ensure that the needed stakeholders in the sector take their responsibility seriously. The government implementing the policies they are supposed to implement, while the private sectors also investing where necessary. And then we see to the reduction of importation of raw materials and uh, invariably importation of milk into the country. So I want to say that the organizers, you have our backings, you have our support, and I want to congratulate you already for the success. And 
also in indulge all other stakeholders here. Please look at the potential of Nigeria uh, dowry sector and ensure that you take advantage of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Oba. Filled with statistics. Please put your hands together for him once more. I would like to recognize the presence of Professor Eustace Yai. He's the Registrar, Nigerian Institute of Animal Sciences. Please, you're welcome, sir. Just wave us and say hello. Put your hands together for him. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. I would like to invite the Director General, Raw Material Research, for their goodwill message. But before then, please, let's put our hands together for the sponsor of this program. We have uh, Integrated Dairies, L and Z, Delhi Frost, and Raw Material Research Development Council. They are coming up right now. Please put your, your hands together for them. You're welcome uh, for your goodwill message. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. delight to deliver a good new message at the Work Milk Day Conference 2022 on the team catalyzing a milk revolution in Nigeria through strategic investments in daily development. This is a very appropriate, this is very appropriate considering that much advocacy in support of developing the local dairy sector in Nigeria through activities of key stakeholders to modernize the traditional pastoral farming in recent times has been on the top of the banner. It is pertinent to note that RM RDC is among the key stakeholders, making practical impact to upgrade the pastoral husbandry through demonstration of simple modern technologies that will ensure increased in milk yield within the nearest future. RM RDC has vigorously pursued pilot demonstration of simple technologies to spur pastoral cooperative groups, as well as other dairy farmers to emulate and replicate similar applications in their dairy ventures. At the moment, emphasis are geared towards upgrading the jam plasm of the indigenous dairy bleeds through artificial insemination with semen from freezing breed. Solar powered milk chillers has also been introduced in the rural dairy communities for preservation of collected milk at four degrees C. Portable milking machines has also been introduced to reduce stress and achieve optimum milking at, at some of the investments that RMRDC has demonstrated towards catalyzing milk revolution in Nigeria. Recognizing the necessary huge investments required to drive viable dairy business, pastoral uh, cooperative groups are being enlightened to pool resources and provide facilities like water, pasture processing, preservation that will ensure adequate nutritional maintenance for the dairy, even at off seasons. Finally, may I commend Kodran? RM, RDC, and other stakeholders 
for advocating catalyzing a milk revolution in Nigeria through strategic investments in dairy development through the 2022 World Milk Day Conference. No doubt all these consistent efforts will impact positively on milk production in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to cordially and I wish to cordial and fruitful deliberation in stimulating investments that will propel modern dairy husbandry for increased milk yield to satisfy industrial and local demand in our country, Nigeria. Thank you and God bless. Please, a louder applause for her. Thank you so much for that. It's still the World Milk Day Conference hosted by Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association of Nigeria and Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition. At this point, I'd like to invite the representative of the Director General Nigeria Governors Forum for his goodwill message. Professor Abagambo, Head, Agri Advisor, Nigerian Governors Forum. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for him, please. Thank you very much. I stand on existing protocol. I represent the Nigerian Governors Forum, and with me here, we have the agri decks of the Nigerian Governors Forum. Before I introduce them, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Nigerian Governors Forum. We are the secretariat of all the 36 governors of Nigeria across political divides. And we are the buffer or the one-stop shop to all the governors in Nigeria. We determine and advise the governors on policies that they can do in their states or they can implement in their states for the benefit of humanity. I handle the agri decks and as the agricultural advisor, you are all aware of the present global food crisis, Russia, Ukraine war, increase in wheat prices, Increase in bread, the representative of the palm tech knows wheat inavailability, fertilizer inavailability, fuel inavailability, all because of these two countries. Coincidentally, Ukraine alone produces about 45% of the global wheat that we all consume. 45 countries, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Somalia, Tunisia, all get their wheat annually from Ukraine. But as we are now talking, one grain of wheat cannot come out from Ukraine. And Nigeria needs about 600 million, 600 million metric tons of wheat per annum. We produce less than 500 metric tons. So we have a huge gap of about 4.5 million metric tons to cover. So these are the kinds of things we see. And then we advise the governors on the way to go forward. Luckily for all of us, we've already identified some few states that are very good in wheat production. And very soon, when, in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, we hope to do something about it. So why the need for you to partner with us? We have four reasons. One, we are the fastest, the safest, the most effective, and the most efficient means of getting to the governors every time. The governors meet every month, a month, a, a, a day to the National Economic Council. So if, for example, you want something that the governors to take up immediately, you give us a presentation, we put you on the agenda for this month, and then you can have the opportunity to meet all the governors physically. And that's what the NGF does. At this juncture, I want to thank the organizers, like already stated, milk is very important. We know that there are four classes of food for one to be balanced. The first one is milk and milk products, which of course is the most limiting in the diets of so many Nigerians. Plenty of us do not take milk, even in a month. And that's the fact, really. So milk is very important. If you don't take milk per day, it means you are, your meal for that particular day is not balanced. And that's the truth. So at this juncture, I want to thank you for inviting us. And then I want to say that we are ready to partner and collaborate with all those that are interested in moving the agricultural landscape forward in Nigeria. 
and we are looking forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you very much. So I'm with the agricultural text, Mrs. Akambi Olubimi. Please, can you stand up for recognition? Can we put our hands together for her? She's down there. And then engineer Mohamed Musa, are you there? And we have our economics, Mala Ablazis. Then we have the NGF media team completely here. They are moving up and down, covering the process for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Please put your hands together for the team from the governor's, Nigeria Governor's Forum. He has given you Expo. The fastest way to reach the governors is through the Nigeria Governor's Forum. Oga, I hope when they begin to sleep it fast to you from here, you will not complain. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it may seem as though we are rushing a bit, but it's because we started behind schedule. So we need to catch up. So bear with us. Catch up with our speed or we slow down for you small. Thank you so much. Um, next on the agenda is still goodwill messages. And I'd like to invite Dr. Oyema Ihedioha from AFDB, please, for his goodwill message. Dr. Oyema, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I stand on existing protocols. And, uh, I want to bring you warm felicitations from the African Development Bank, Abidjan, our president, Dr. Teshino, who couldn't make it to this uh, event. You know, some important milestones you need to think about. The average consumption of milk by a Nigerian is eight liters per day. Meanwhile, the world average is 44 liters per day. So you could see the differential in our milk consumption in the country. The country uses about 1.5 liters of milk per day, and we can only produce 500,000 liters. So you can see the shortfall in the production of milk. And that's why we're importing a lot to the tune of $1.5 billion of milk in the country every year. Livestock contributes about 8% of the GDP of agriculture, which is 25 to our national GDP. Which means it's an important sector. The bank has supported a couple of countries in their livestock program. And that's why the bank has developed what we call Livestock Investment Master Plan, with which we are helping to develop livestock in several countries in Africa. Let me also mention that the bank has done a lot in this area of livestock. So we have a lot of experiences you can draw from. And luckily for us, the Ministry of Agriculture is here. So we can always interact and give you some information on what can help this country develop. What is also important is, um, I need to mention that uh, as a bank, we flew all the way from Abidjan to come here. There are things we don't like to hear. And one of those things is potential. We say we have potential, we have potential, but nobody has ever eaten potential. So any potential that cannot be put to constructive use is just useless. So let us not talk about our potential. Let us talk of what we can do on ground and move ourselves forward. Number two. We hear that we have a lot of pilot projects, pilot. We have a lot of pilots in the country, but no plane is taking off. So what's the point of having pilots when nothing is taking off? So let us think of what can be done actually on the ground. And this is what the bank can help you do. We have invested $1.6 billion this year on livestock development in Africa. And incidentally, we have uh, approved the stable crop, stable crop processing zone project in Nigeria. And livestock is a very big component of that uh, project. So I invite you to layers with my colleague who is in the Nigerian office here to see how livestock can benefit maximally from that uh, project. Finally, I think there is something I need to underscore, which is very, very important. And that relates to the post-harvest handling of milk. And this is where we are getting it wrong. 
We produce milk, but most of them get lost on transit. Therefore, any liter of milk that is wasted is a waste resource. It doesn't add up to anything. I think this is an area we have to intervene seriously. And let me give you one information that we need we have all of us. If we develop along the capital corridors, milk collection centers, and this is what I'm dropping for this uh, association. If you develop along the milk corridor, the cattle corridors, milk collection centers equipped with coolers, you will harvest most of the milk that are being produced into these milk collection centers, cool them, and transport them to where they can be processed. I think that if we look at the surface losses and issues of milk, we are going to help our people. Finally, I saw that most of us are wearing glasses. It's because you don't drink a lot of uh, milk. If you check our old parents, because milk is very rich in vitamin A and also very rich in vitamin D. Most of our old parents, including your fathers, they can read without glasses because they drank milk. Some of them even stood with their mothers for more than one year. So they have good visibility. If you drink more milk, I am telling you that the money you're wasting buying glasses will not be there. So drink more milk and you will see the difference in your life. And uh, <clears throat> finally, for young people who are still producing children, after you win your child of your breast milk, research has shown that if you feed your child with milk for the next one year, the intelligent quotient IQ of that child is going to increase by 25%. So you can see, if you're beating your child that is not taking first in class, it could be that you are the cause why he's not taking first in class. I thought I should drop those messages from the African Development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The papers the bank prepared for this uh, conference, I've handed it over to the uh, MC, who will share it as appropriate. Thank you. Please put your hands together for him once again. The strange thing now is when I see you wearing glasses, I begin to suspect that you didn't have enough milk while growing up. So that's how the mind works. So luckily for someone like me, no glasses simply means enough milk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please, another round of applause for him, please. At this point, I would like to invite the representative of the permanent secretary, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, Mrs. Ulumuyiwa Ajayade. She is the Deputy Director, Agro Allied Industry, Federal Ministry of Industry and Trade Investment. Put your hands together for her, please, as she makes her way to the podium. Good morning, participants. I don't know whether I'm still right. We're in the morning or we've entered afternoon. I'm not sure. Okay. Good afternoon, participants. I'm here to represent the Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Evelyn Ngigi, who is unavoidably absent because of the exigencies of office, but sent her, her best wishes. So, goodwill message of the Permanent Secretary of Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Evelyn Ngigi, at the 2020 World Meat Day Conference, organized by Commercial Dairy Regions of Nigeria, Kodaran, on 1st June 2020 at Sheraton Hotel, Abuja. I wish to start on existing protocol. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you today to celebrate 2022 World, World Milk Day. I wish to congratulate the organizers of this event, the Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association of Nigeria, Kodaran, which over the years have championed this event. Commitment of Kodaran to the economic development of the nation through the creation of awareness 
on the dairy and health benefits of consuming healthy meal as a major part of nutrition is commendable. Permit me to mention here that the conference, noting that the federal government of Nigeria is at the verge of approving dairy policy. Therefore, I appeal to rededicate its effort to backward integration program, BIP, and further deepen its investment in the dairy sector, as the policy is armed with both fiscal and fiscal measures to make the sector succeed. The present administration is resolute in its commitment to the diversification of the economy, leveraging on sectors where we have comparative and competitive advantage in production and processing. In line with Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan, NIRP, the dairy sector is one of such that has been identified identify the effective level to divert economy. It is on this, I reiterate the Federal Ministry of Industries, Trade and Investment, we continue to foster collaboration with Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Rural Development, Central Bank of Nigeria, and other critical stakeholders in the dairy sector in order to make Nigeria a self-sufficient nation in dairy production and processing. Finally, let me use this opportunity to commend Coderan for contributing immensely to the rebirth of the dairy sector in Nigeria by buying into the backward integration program of the ministry. And in doing so, several dairy have been established, and most importantly, Coderan of stakes raw milk from smallholder farmers and pastoralists in a quest to boost local dairy production and processing in Nigeria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all participants for taking our time to greet this occasion. Thank you for listening and God bless Nigeria. Please, a louder hands of applause for her, please. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, before I introduce this woman, anytime I want to introduce her, home training will want to leave my body. I feel like shouting and jumping because I know her worth and what she can do, what she has been doing and what she will still do. She is here today wearing a different cap, but she is my madam any day, anytime. And a go-to person, she has the knowledge of my husband in her palm. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me and welcome on the podium. Representative of the government secretary, Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Andrew. Please join me and welcome on the podium. Nigeria. Alaji Aba, the agricultural advisor to the Nigerian Institute of Professor Eustace Yayi, Registrar, Nigerian Institute of Animal Science, erudite scholars here present. 
private investors and partners in the dairy sector. Most distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, when my brother came up to talk about glasses and milk, I got a bit because I have my glasses in my eye too. Then I told him which are basic. A lot has already been said. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to thank address at the 2022 World Milk Day, representing the permanent who is unavoidably absent, and the honorable minister who is presently attending PEC. This World Milk Day Conference is being organized by the Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association and it is themed catalyzing the milk revolution in Nigeria through strategic investment in dairy development. The theme for this year's conference aligned very seamlessly with the economic diversification and sustainability focus of government and all critical stakeholders. I commend the members, president and board of trustees of CODERA for their determination and effort to keep the issues of the daily sector on the front corner and along with them, all their numerous partners the health from Dalton Agriculture and Nutrition. This annual conference held on the globally celebrated World Day Day will no doubt ensure that the very critical and strategic dairy sector remains in the forefront of our national economic discourse until we get to where we want. With the unwavering support of, the, of Mr. President and the visionary leadership of the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, in the ministry, we recognize the significance of the dairy sector in Nigeria's quest for sustainable economic development and has made it a priority sector in our economic development plan and programs. The National Livestock Transformation Plan, meticulously being implemented by Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, is a testament to the commitment of the present administration to create a robust, vibrant, and compet competitive livestock and dairy sector capable of meeting our needs and the demands of the dairy products, capable of creating jobs, ensuring optimal nutrition and social economic cohesion. When we talk about nutrition, let us rem remember Dr. Ihedi Oradimian and all he has said about dairy. He was about milk. He was short of saying that if you never took milk as a child, that you will grow up to be an idiot, which is what is very popularly said. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development is also the forefront of implementing the National Livestock Development Program, National Pasture Development Program, the Livestock Productivity and Resilience Support Project. All of these aim to improve productivity, commercialization, and resilience of targeted livestock production systems. Talking about production system, right behind us, we have the first national security, national security summit on pastorality. So when you talk about production system, a lot of our minds want to look at that pastorality as a very, very beginning, the extensive system before we move to where we want to be, the me and intensive. So these programs to, are to address all these systems. These are many other strategic interventions and 
partnerships in livestock and dairy development, including the setting up of meal collection centers in strategic locations within the country. And indeed, also providing support for dairy clusters all over the country and dairy cooperatives. These are done through annual budgetary project allocations. And so it reinforces government's dedication to building and sustaining a productive national economy with a self-sufficient dairy sector as one of its famous pillars. Many a time we don't really um, acknowledge what government is really putting in in the livestock sector, particularly dairy. A lot of effort currently ongoing from the government side to improve the dairy sector and to reduce the import, the foreign exchange we spend on dairy, importing dairy and dairy products. In fulfilling government's pivotal role of creating an enabling environment for business activities to strive, FMAD, in collaboration with other critical stakeholders in the dairy sector, formulated the national dairy policy. And this policy is to effectively regulate and provide guidance for activities within the dairy sector. The draft policy, like we heard from the representative of the permanent secretary of FMITI, is awaiting key approvals and will soon become operational. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development will continue to propose and implement holistic solutions to decade old problems in the Nigerian livestock and dairy sector and position, to position it for global competitiveness. The unsustainable annual spending, like I've just said, of estimated 1.5 billion USD of the country's scarce foreign exchange to import just milk and milk products, as give, told to us by CBN, is completely unacceptable. You will agree with me. And we should discourage it. This conference from the team therefore seeks a roadmap for catalyzing a milk revolution in Nigeria. This revolution, we are hoping, will grow Nigeria's local milk production volumes way beyond what we have to do and way beyond what we need in the country so that we can think of expansion. The conference presents yet another opportunity for us distinguished stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, in the dairy sector, challenge existing paradigms, share and learn innovative approaches to resolving the systemic challenges that so long have stalled progress in the dairy sector. A call for paradigm shift. I wish to reassure you of the willingness of the federal government continue its collaboration with private sector stakeholders to achieve inclusive livestock transformation in Nigeria. As you participate actively in this conference, it is my sincere desire that discussions and learning will open up new possibilities for partnership that will ensure the attainment of food security for our people.
outside. Go back here. outside the group photograph will be happening by the photo stand outside the permanent secretary the dignitaries they'll all be visiting the exhibition stand please all participants are also free to pay a visit to the exhibition stand go around I'm pretty sure some of them have free milk for testing, for sampling. We we'll assemble back here immediately after the tea break. Ooh. Wow.
Good morning, everybody. of Senator Kabiru Gaya from Kano South Senatorial District. If you are here, just wave at us, please. Okay. Also in our presence is Ahmed Usman Rashid. He's the Assistant Director, 
Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. You're welcome, sir. Okay, he's already there. Welcome, sir. I would like, I also like to recognize the presence of Baba Gana Imam. He is the Deputy Director, Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. If you're here, just wave at us. Okay, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. I welcome you back from the tea break. It is still the World Milk Day Conference organized by the Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association of Nigeria, also co-organized by Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited. The theme for this year is catalyzing a milk revolution in Nigeria through strategic investments in dairy development. You're welcome back. We begin this segment with the keynote address by Dr. Hope Pachana, Pachena. Dr. Hope Pachena is an operations officer, upstream manufacturing agribusiness and services, Soft Saharan Africa International Finance Cooperation, FIC. Mr. Hope Pachena, please. Put your hands together for him. You're welcome, sir. Yes, uh, to all the key stakeholders and uh, the special invited guests, uh, I would want to thank you uh, for this, uh, 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 for actually inviting me uh, to speak to you as the keynote speaker. Um, it is an honor uh, for me uh, from IFC to be speaking to, to you on this special day, the Milk, uh, Milk Day, which is an important day, uh, I think for Nigeria, it's very clear it's, it should be an important day for us to rethink uh, as the stakeholders of the, of the milk industry. We are all here. We should be thinking how we should revolutionize this, uh, uh, the, the milk industry in Nigeria, the dairy revolution. I think uh, quite a number of speakers before me have spoken uh, a lot about the potential in this sector. So I'll just go through, but uh, not take a, a lot of time on that because it has been well said by uh, some of the speakers before me. So if we look at the Nigerian dairy industry, we are all aware that uh, Nigeria is importing uh, every year uh, up to 1.6 billion uh, US dollars of milk and milk products. And what does that mean? To me, it means as Nigeria, we are exporting jobs. Uh, that milk, where it's coming from, it's actually employing people that are producing that milk and the milk products. And at the end of the day, Nigerians are not benefiting from that. This is just in terms of what is being consumed by Nigeria, which is 60% of, of, of the requirement that Nigeria needs. Because Nigeria currently produces only 40% of the, the annual needs. So what does that tell you? There's a big opportunity in the dairy sector. But before I, I move into the details uh, of the dairy sector, I would want to say that as International Finance Corporation, uh, IFC, uh, which is International Finance Corporation, we are a sister organization of the World Bank. Uh, but what do we do is we only focus on the private sector. We, our focus is to work with private companies uh, to actually develop the private sector. Uh, of, of countries and the whole world at large. So uh, in IFC, we've got strategic sectors, uh, which one of them is animal protein, sustainable animal protein. And milk falls within this uh, category uh, of our focus. So for Nigeria, we've identified dairy as an important sector that uh, we need to focus on. But working with you uh, as the key stakeholders to make sure Nigeria becomes self-sufficient in terms of milk production. We've also identified beef uh, as a key sector for us in Nigeria uh, and the leather sector. So 
we believe uh, with the demand that is currently uh, 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 there for meal, as we speak, uh, that the milk sector can really uh, bring uh, a, a, a big uh, developmental impact to the, to the Nigeria uh, as a country. Uh, it has got potential to change the life of Nigerians because the potential to bring employment if we localize production, but it's not easy. I think one of my, the speakers, uh, Dr. Damian, mentioned to you about pilots. We've got pilots, we've got this, but uh, we are not working. Our hands are not on the, on the deck to, to get this uh, to happen. Um, can, can we move to the, yes. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, just, just a few highlights there. Uh, the demand for milk, we are looking per year for Nigeria, looking to, uh, at a figure of 1.3 million tons. And uh, of that, we are only producing 500,000 tons. You see the gap that is there. The balance is being imported, as I have mentioned earlier on. Uh, the figure for imports I won't mention. Then next slide, which I did mention earlier on. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, just to show you a snapshot and a comparison of where Nigeria sits uh, in terms of uh, annual milk production, uh, comparing to Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. You, see, you can see that first uh, graph to your left. Nigeria is the lowest there uh, with the least production. Uh, if you compare to Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, the second uh, graph in the middle, where you're looking at the number of dairy cows, you can see Nigeria has got the least number of dairy cows compared to Ethiopia and Kenya. If you look at the yield per cow, also Nigeria, that's the last slide to your right, is with the lowest yield per cow. We're talking to 1.5, one, one liter to 1.5 liters per day, which is very low, compared uh, to, to, to other countries that are achieving 20 liters per day. So in terms of the cows production, we still have a lot to go in this sector. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this slide is just showing you uh, the, 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 what you call the value chain in a nutshell, that we have got your inputs there to your left, uh, which is the, the cows, the head, and also the, the input providers. And here we are talking about pastoralists and a few of uh, the commercial producers that are also producing means that the production, the second uh, line there in the middle, where you've got uh, importers of milk and milk products. You've got the commercial dairy farmers, the pastoralists. Then from there, you move to processing, where you've got informal processors, formal local processors, and multinational processors. Then lastly, the marketing. That's where you take your products to the market, where you've got wholesalers and retailers, and then local markets, and then the consumers that come. Next slide, please. Uh, still, uh, this is showing you also the, the value chain, just to, to summarize the, the issues that we find in each part of the value chain. And uh, of not there, that I would want to mention to you is production. Uh, we have got a lot of work to do in terms of genetics. Our production is not good. And uh, also uh, use of outdated practices like cooling and all that and need to also uh, work on our aggregation uh, 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 methods so that they are up to date uh, with the new methods that we currently have. Next slide, please. Yes, I will spend a bit of time on this uh, uh, slide because this is what IFC can offer. Um, IFC has looked at the dairy sector of Nigeria and say, how can we assist, how can we work together with the private sector to develop uh, this sector? So what we have, what I have seen, have seen uh, is that in the market, most companies have got very good ideas, but these ideas, they are not bankable. So what, what do we need to do to make these ideas bankable? IFC have actually formed a division that can work with the private sector to develop those ideas to a point where they are bankable, to a point where IFC can now invest, put its money, 
to a point where if you take that idea to any bank, any bank can give you money. So we are ready to work with the private sector to develop those ideas. Um, but how do we do that? Let's say you want to expand your data uh, 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 operation or data processing. Uh, you come to us, we do a plan to say, let's develop this together. Let's do a market assessment. Let's do a feasibility. We do that together with you as a private player. IFC contributing half of the costs that are required to develop uh, that business idea. But how is IFC going to benefit by doing this? Uh, IFC has taken that step further because it realized that uh, there are so many few projects out there that are bankable. So we need to work with you, the private sector, in the dairy sector specifically, to develop those ideas until they become bankable. And uh, we will recover our money at financial close. When that project that we have developed together moves to uh, in, an investment, when we want the money, that's when we add whatever contribution we have made, we add it to the loan that we are going to give you. Then, what are the benefits of working with the IFC? Uh, as we are aware, IFC, we are a worldwide organization. We, we have got offices across the world, over 100 offices. And most uh, international development financial institutions, once they know IFC is there, we are trying to fund a business. Other DFIs also want to follow because they know we just don't find something that is, not, uh, that is not quality. So those are the benefits. Secondly, you also benefit from our experiences throughout the world where we can bring you value by giving you new ideas uh, that you can modify to suit your situation in Nigeria. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, it's not moving. Uh, it's not going to the next slide. It's fine. We can. Okay, so uh, I'm here uh, today, honored to, to 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 present to you is is because this sector uh, has got uh, good opportunities. The dairy sector for Nigeria. I think we have. Uh, the speakers before me, they've all actually emphasized uh, what potential this sector uh, has. And then uh, what we need from you as the private sector is, uh, as we engage, uh, we, we need to know your plans that we have. Uh, if you want to approach us, one thing we need to know from you as a private company is what plans do you have uh, to, 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 to actually to, to to, to develop local supply, supply of raw meal. Then secondly, uh, what are the specific challenges that you are currently facing uh, in terms of your, your, your plan to develop raw milk supply, including processing? And then uh, the other issue that we also need to look at is the specific opportunities that we have seen as a company that are making you wanting to invest in the dairy sector, followed by if you are facing any challenges uh, that are related to policy or regulations that you would want the government to look at, why is this important? Uh, I've told you, as Sister Kamban of the World Bank, we do have uh, the World Bank colleagues that uh, work directly with the government. So whatever you are facing, we can engage them, both their government facing, to work with the government to, to actually uh, try and, and and maybe resolve those uh, issues that are related to policy or regulations that you might be faced. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I would want to stress again, as I've done in the face, that uh, the dairy sector is quite, is very important for us uh, as IFC. And we're looking forward to engage um, with some of the companies that are here. As long as you've got good ideas, uh, I want to say to you, uh, don't waste your time, approach us so that we talk, we understand you, and then we'll see how we can work together. I will okay. stop there, and actually, if you have got questions, uh, I'll, I I'll bring this to you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Hmm. Uh, we will have to detain him on the stage for now. Uh, Hodoran would like to appreciate Mr. Pachena or Dr. Pachena for his contributions with an award. And to present this award, I would like to invite Mr. Shane Shekari, MD, CEO, IDL, and National Treasurer Hodoran to present the award. Please put your hands together for him, please. Yes, it's been made available now. Is that what's okay for picture? Okay, come forward, please. Please put your hands together, please. would like to appreciate sponsors of this conference, Integrated Dairies Limited, L and Z. Put your hands together for them, please. Delhi Frost, Raw Material Research Development Council. And the co-host for today is Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition. Sahel and Consulting. at this point, I would like to invite Sahel to the podium. Managing partner, Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited, Mr. And nutrition. Temi Adegoroye, to give us an overview Adegoroye. of the Aldeim project by Sahel Consulting. Put your hands together for him, please. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, my job is very simple. I will just be taking us through a couple of slides, uh, introducing the Audin program, the Advancing Local Trade Development Program in Nigeria. But also, uh, I would like to uh, leverage some of the initial presentations that we've had and just uh, do a brief overview of the dairy sector in, in Nigeria, um, you know, probably see why we're not producing enough and why we're not consuming enough milk. Please advance the slides. I will start by speaking a, a, uh, a bit about Sai Consulting. Sai Consulting is a management consulting firm. So we work as a management consulting firm, uh, partnering with various stakeholders in government, uh, private sector, leading international development organizations to conduct in-depth market research uh, across key value chains. Uh, we analyze and shape policies. We develop strategies, launch innovative business and ecosystem solutions, organize convenings, uh, uh, basically to promote sustainable agricultural development across Africa. Our vision is to be recognized as the most trusted consulting partner and point of reference in the African agricultural nutrition landscape integral to building effective, resilient, and dynamic uh, value chains and attaining food security. And we have a mission to transform Africa's agriculture and nutrition uh, landscape through the work that we do. We offer a range of services. Uh, you can see on the screen, value chain analysis. We have in-depth knowledge of you know, how value chains work. Uh, and we offer lots of consulting support uh, from strategy to policy uh, consulting. We also develop and introduce ecosystem solutions. We, we've uh, started a number of organizations uh, based on the passion that we have uh, towards the development of the agricultural landscape. Also, we provide training support. We invest a lot in capacity development, both for smallholder dairy producers, producers or small, smallholder farmers at large, as well as emerging and, and existing entrepreneurs in the, Afri in the African agricultural landscape. Please go to the next slide. Uh, we have a range of partners. That's not an exhaustive list. This is all the slide could take, but we have a range of partners. You can see the mix of the partners that we have, uh, ranging from international development organizations to, to international research institutes, uh, local research institutes, as well as private, uh, the private sector. So the next one. Okay, so, so while I move gradually into uh, the conversation around dairy, I would like to just introduce you to some of the 
high in, uh, impact intervention programs that we are currently implementing across a number of uh, value chains. Uh, I will pause on the advanced liquidity development in Nigeria because that is that the, 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 the crux of the conversation. But I will go to the next three, uh, the FMAT capacity support project. We are working with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development to uh, basically support institutional capacity strengthening around policy uh, development and implementation. Um, we started our project in 2020, we're going to end in 2023. Uh, we are a, one of the implementing partners of the Building and Economically Sustainable Integrated Cassava System in, in, in Nigeria and, and Tanzania. And uh, we are working under the leadership of the International Institute of Tropical, Tropical Agriculture, ITA, to implement this project. Uh, this project will run for five years from 2020 uh, to 2025. And we are also leading the implementation of the collaborative seed program, which is another integrated seed uh, industry development initiative focused on building the capacity of stakeholders within the seed sector as well as supporting smallholder farmers to ensure that they are able to access improved uh, varieties of uh, seeds of various crops. Please go to the next slide. Okay, so let's start talking about dairy. Um, a lot of the speakers earlier today actually tr uh, threw out a number of statistics. We, we have, it's huge. And uh, the estimated cattle population about 20 million cattle, including about 2 million uh, cows used for dairy production. So our dairy cattle is about two, 2 million, they're about. But if you look down the map, uh, you see that we have about 90% of you know, the, the raw milk produced uh, coming from the small order producers. And also the hand market is, is controlled by large multinationals uh, that use imported, imported milk in over 97% of, of the product that they, they, they process uh, for consumption. And if you look to the right hand side of the slide, you see that we, uh, on the average, produce about 0 0.6 million tons. And I think some of the speakers today talked about, I think mentioned 500,000, 500,000, 600,000, maybe around that, um, with an estimated annual milk consumption of uh, about 1.7 million. That's really our demand between 1.7 and 1.8 million. Of course, you see that we have a lot of gaps. And when you look at the production, you know, figure there, you see that our dairy, our local dairy production in Nigeria is not competitive. Uh, we, our productivity is less than a tenth of the global average. You look at the biggest producers in the world and what they are actually attaining in terms of the total annual milk production per cow. Please move the move the slide. So I would like to quickly take. Uh, allow us to take a quick look at the dairy value chain in Nigeria and you know the interconnectedness or interrelationships of the various actors and stakeholders within the, the value chain and how this value chain is currently working or functioning. On the production end, we have the pastoralists and peri-urban farmers. Uh, they control about 95% of, of the, the cattle population and produce uh, uh, the majority of the raw milk we, we currently use in Nigeria. Then we have the commercial farmers who uh, own a mix of indigenous cows and crossbreds, uh, produce the remaining raw milk that we use. And of course, we have huge imports uh, of, of powdered milk. Um, we also then have, you know, in the process of hand, informal processors. We have a lot of informal processors uh, who are processing the actually most of the raw milk that we, we currently produce in Nigeria, these people are processing into uh, local dairy products. And the women actually play a lot of role in this particular uh, aspect of the value chain. Uh, we have former local processors. Uh, I mean, we have Codoran here and many of the, the, the companies under, under Codoran who are actively playing within the, the formal uh, processing end of the value chain in Nigeria, uh, typically, they are integrated commercial farmers who process their own raw milk uh, with a mix of some sort of imported powdered milk. Um, some also source raw milk from pastoralists uh, through the milk collection centers and their backward integration plants. Um, then we have the multinationals. Of course, the multinationals use a lot more of powdered milk. And some of them now have started to you know, invest in you know, backward integration efforts. Um, 
Of course, we have many of these products flow into both the local markets as well as the wholesale uh, retail, retailers. And we have policies, you know, where uh, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Federal Ministry of Industry Trade and Investment, the Central Bank of Nigeria are play, uh, doing a lot of work around uh, policy uh, support for the dairy sector. Uh, we have quite a number of associations. Codoran, I think at the moment, is taking the lead in this space. Uh, but we also have quite a number of associations that are currently coming up. Uh, for example, yesterday I received a test message from, from another association that has just been recently formed, and I said, oh, Kudara uh, needs to know about this association. Okay, so why dairy? Please move. Yes, thanks. So why dairy? Why is dairy important? Um, to us as Sire Consulting, there are about four things. The first one is that it's one of the best accessible sources of nutrition. And we really cannot... Okay, I think we need to pause the, this presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's make welcome the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Mr. Abu Bakr is in our presence, please. You're welcome, sir. The Minister of Agriculture, he will just say hello and give, say something brief on milk. Just wait for him to get ready. And yes, together for him, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, especially the officials of Quadran. I just thought since you are here, I will, even though I have a representative, somebody that's already spoken, but since I'm here, I feel it's very important that I show my face and uh, just to give a goodwill message on this World Milk Day today. Of course, we all know the importance of uh, milk for good. Uh, for calcium and good bones. We want to age with our bones uh, strong and not feeble, breaking easily. And you are providing that uh, remedy. So I wish you the best uh, this day and uh, forward. I had to just quit my uh, Federal Executive Council to attend this. And then of course now here, I, I am on my way back. I'm happy to be here and thank you for uh, putting this together. Thank you and bye-bye. Please rise and say farewell to the Minister, Foreign Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar. Thank you very much. Uh, we apologize for interrupting the ongoing activities. We'd like to welcome back Mr. Adegoreye, please. Put your hands together for him, for understanding. We can continue the presentation. Okay, so I was uh, mentioning why dairy is important to, to us and what I think is important to be talked about. Um, it's one of the best accessible sources of uh, nutrition. It's all significant opportunity to empower women and you all will agree with me, especially based on how uh, you know, local dairy landscape is, is set up, the role of women in you know, dairy production, where within a typical pastoralist household, the, the men own the cow, the, the women own the milk, you know, and you know, lots of you know, activities happening at the grassroots level, uh, coordinated by women. Also, uh, dairy, 
when you talk about climate mitigation adaptation, dairy or livestock generally play a, a huge role because uh, uh, dairy production in the world globally today uh, is, uh, is actually one of the biggest contributors to, 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 to climate, uh, climate related issues. And there are a lot of work and investment in this area globally in trying to understand you know, how we could actually you know, use dairy production practices to, to reduce the, the effect of climate change. Then the last reason why this is very important is because you know, the world has committed to achieving these sustainable development goals. But when you look at dairy in itself, you realize that it takes a lot of boxes within the sustainable development goals. Almost more than 50% of the goals could actually be achieved if we pursue you know, uh, real transformation within the dairy, the dairy sector. So, so please advance the slide. I would like to just quickly talk about some of the, the key challenges as we have found within the, uh, the advancing local, local day development program uh, being implemented by Style Consulting. The first one is farmer productivity challenges. You see, we have a lot of indigenous cows. Most of our cows are indigenous, you know, so of course, typically they have low milk yield potential. Uh, we're talking about about 0.5 to 1.5 liters of milk per cow per day. That's very, very low compared to, you know, global best practice of about 30 liters, uh, up to 30 liters or 30, 35 liters of, of milk per cow per day. Imagine comparing 30 liters to, you know, 1.5, 0.5 liters. Also, farmers have limited access to water and to quality feed. And these two are actually very critical for dairy production. And these are the big, these are very big issues within the, you know, the local dairy development uh, landscape in Nigeria. Also critical inputs such as, you know, semen, vaccines and, and drugs, you know, that you really need for real productivity improvement are seriously lacking. Also farmers do not have access to adequate services uh, such as training and animal health care. That's so important. So you have this huge population of cattle, about 20 million cattle, and we do not have sufficient, you know, healthcare services to be rendered to, 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 to those cows. It becomes a, big of, a bit of a challenge. And of course, achieving low, the reason why we're achieving, achieving low productivity uh, is not far-fetched. Please move the slides. The next challenge here is farmers limited participation in the former dairy sector. You know, locally sourced raw milk is uncompetitive, like I said before, compared to, you know, milk import. Farmers are unable to produce or provide consistent large volumes of milk to the, to the processor partners. And we have quite a number of processor partners within the Audi program, and we understand these real, real challenges that they face. Um, also, milk quality is often poor uh, within the, the local uh, production set, setup. Um, and, you know, raw milk collection, aggregation, evacuation, you know, are also very critical challenges in this landscape. Move to the next one, uh, talking about gender specific challenges in the dairy, dairy sector. You know, women have limited ownership and control over productive resources, uh, which is also very important because if we're going to be able to increase productivity, you know, and I say it all the time across all sectors, if we're going to increase productivity within the country, we need also make sure that we, you know, deliberately harness the opportunities and the potential of the women uh, because they form a huge part of the population. Uh, also, uh, women lack access to, you know, uh, you know, and also inclusion in formalized structures, uh, limited availability of skilled female extension agents. Many times within the Audin program, we've seen where we send extension agents to, you know, uh, pastoralist households to train them on good dairy production practices and, you know, all these various uh, training models that we have within the household most of those extension agents cannot administer training to women because they are male. And when we extension, agricultural extension landscape in Nigeria, you, you could barely find you know, many female, uh, uh, female extension. Uh, also, you know, a lot of people trek long distances uh, you know, to market to sell their products, especially the, the, the local, locally processed products. The last one is nutritional challenges, which is really around you know, the high rate of malnutrition, even within the dairy producing households. Uh, and of course, nutrition security is very key for food security. Go to the next challenge. So uh, I would then talk about uh, the Audin program. 
the overview of the program. Howdin basically uh, stands for Advancing Local Day Development in Nigeria. Uh, we started this program in 2020. It's the second phase of an initial program that we implemented uh, for about two and a half years called the, National, the Nigerian Day Development Program. Aldin aims to catalyze a vibrant local dairy sector in an inclusive way that uh, improves the livelihoods, productivity, nutrition, and empowerment of small dairy producers, especially women, uh, and also within the, the communities that they live. Um, we have about five core objectives, uh, as highlighted there, advocating for an enabling environment for local milk sourcing, increasing demand for locally sourced milk from small dairy households, improving smallholder dairy farmers' productivity, empowering women dairy farmers, and of course, improving nutrition outcomes uh, among the smallholder dairy uh, households. And when you look at the objectives of the Howding program and you know, the theme for this World Milk Day event you know, around backward integration and ensuring milk sufficiency in Nigeria, you see that the Howding program kind of ticks all of the boxes. And that's why it's important for us to talk about it. Let's go to the next slide. We have a lot of partners under the Audim program. Uh, within the government, we're working with... Next slide, please. Within the government, we're working with, of course, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, uh, Federal Ministry of Trade, uh, Industry and Investment. Uh, we're working with you know, state government across the various states where we work. Uh, we're working with our dairy processor partners. You can see uh, some of them... Uh, I see them listed there. LNZ is one of our partners. Uh, Intuitive Dairies Limited is one of our partners, Ala, Sage Foods, as well as Sebore uh, Farms. We have some implementing partners because we can't do this alone. Uh, it's a very complex and you know, very uh, large project. So we're working with TechnoServe. Uh, TechnoServe is leading our farm organization components and formation of separate groups and, and cooperatives within the, the, the dairy communities. We're working with Life247.com, providing animal healthcare services to, to those farmers. We're, we're working with some international organizations as well. The, the last two logos there represent our partners for productivity improvement. Euros is a, an American company uh, that specializes working with them around uh, anim, uh, artificial insemination and genetic improvement component of our day. Uh, BKD is a local uh, artificial insemination partner in Nigeria. Mathematica and Taneja are strategic partners uh, for monitoring and evaluation. These are these two uh, both international organizations as well. Please move to the next slide so we can just see some of uh, just activities in pictures. Um, a very critical component in our dean is training. Training for us to achieve sufficiency in dairy production. You would agree with me that is a need for us to actually increase the rate of capacity development. Uh, of both rural farmers, the pastoralists, as well as all the various critical actors and stakeholders within the dairy value chain. So that's why we are focusing a lot on building capacity, the capacity of various actors. Some of the pictures there would be uh, pictures that shows uh, various training sessions on several modules. And if you visit our stand outside, you'll see those various modules that we've developed uh, customized for, for training and building the capacity of the stakeholders. Please go to the next slide. On the next slide, we'll see the cooperative formation and strengthening process. Uh, our approach in our dean is really very simple. We want to be very strategic about it. So we first identified, you know, those farmers within their households and, you know, within the communities that they are, they live. Then we form them into small groups uh, that we call CFF groups. And then we start to build the capacity within the CFF groups. And through the CFF groups, they can supply a lot of milk to the process of partners. And through the CFF groups, we continue to introduce a lot of the various interventions that Howdy has to offer. So this is a process. Uh, th these are some of the you know, sessions within the CFF group strengthening process. That is uh, a certificate of registration for one of the dairy cooperatives that we've, we've, we've set up. And our hope is that looking into the future, by the end and beyond Howdy, we can actually you know, start to see many of these cooperatives grow into larger organizations, larger corporations. The next slide there is called policy advocacy. Uh, we're working with governments, you know, industry associations, institutions, and private sector stakeholders uh, to you know, promote local dairy sourcing, backward integration within the country. Um, you see, Adva Business School have developed a case study on the Audin program, and also we have, uh, you know, even the the the, the World Milk Day from the last from last year 
and our support of Kodaran. We've been working, we've been working with Kodaran a lot. We actually with Kodaran for almost one year uh, to make sure that that uh, association can actually, you know, really stand and, you know, take the lead in policy advocacy efforts uh, for the dairy, for dairy development in Nigeria. The next slide is productivity improvements. So within the productivity improvement component of how we have the feed and fodder or pasture development process, because of course you can't talk about productivity improvement without talking about sustainable feed or pasture development in Nigeria. It's very critical. We've said it in many, many you know, meetings like this that feed security is, is tantamount to, to national security. So it's very critical. So this, this is a process of building the capacity of pastoralists around the production of A and silage. Animal health is one of those areas where we're working. You can see some of the doctors, vet doctors, I think, to, to cows and also an artificial insemination. Uh, currently, as we speak, we've recorded uh, the birth of some of our new calves within the various communities where we work. The next slide is just showing some of the collaboration areas with the government. The first one is provision of uh, enabling environments, uh, a policy environment that enables uh, or encourages local mixed sourcing especially from smaller pastoralists. This is very dear to our hearts, and we're really pursuing this, working with the government uh, to make sure that we achieve this. Uh, the second one is collaboration to develop pastoral land with grazing reserves to, to, at, at state levels. Uh, also, we're providing, uh, I mean, we're working with the government to provide feeder roads that lead to smallholder dairy uh, farms and communities. And the last one is really the provision of the essential services. These services are very critical. I talked about, you know, extension services, training and capacity. This is really, really critical. And the government is supporting, it, supporting us in this, in this area. That next slide is looking at what, how we see, how we view success beyond the five years of this outing program. Uh, we want to make sure that we would have been able to reach about 210,000 beneficiaries. Uh, would have built about 75 boreholes, solar powered boreholes within those communities. Uh, we would have formed about 1,400 CFF groups, and many of those CFF groups would have actually metamorphosized into, you know, dairy cooperatives. We would have trained about 120,000 uh, uh, farmers around good dairy practices. Uh, procured about 15,000 meat cans. You know, we would have set up a framework for about, you know, 50. Veterinar veterinarians as well as you know artificial insemination technicians who are going to continue to provide services within those local communities. Uh, we're hoping that our principal partners by the end of this program would be able to uptake a uh, minimum 190,000 liters of milk per day from, from those, those farmers who would have inseminated about 8,000 8, uh, cows and would have produced about 80,000 tons of feed. Uh, but most importantly for us with feed uh, production is really, you know, building a, a sustainable framework for, for, for feed production. And currently we are collaborating with the farmers, we are collaborating with commercial food producers to ensure that we build a, a commercially viable and economically driven uh, pasture uh, development landscape in Nigeria. The last, the next slide is my last slide. My last slide. Okay. So I, I, before I leave, I want us to take a look at, you know, my own judgment of what success should be like for the Nigerian dairy sector. And I, I know we all have uh, ideas and our opinions of this. These are my own personal opinion. Uh, the first one, so I said catalyzing a vibrant dairy sector in Nigeria requires robust and systemic development that includes the key stakeholders across the value chain. Let's go to the first one. Next, okay, so, so the first one is a sustainable reduction of milk imports through the establishment of an enabling environment for local dairy value chain development. That's number one. The second one, we need to increase the participation of smallholder farmers in the formal, the participation of smallholder farmers in the formal dairy value chain through established cooperatives and, and structured groups. The next one, we need to improve smallholder dairy production systems, and we need to incentivize local sourcing of milk from pastoralists. Number four, we need an increased network of skilled private public service providers, including extension agents, community health workers, artificial insemination technicians, veterinary doctors, and other service providers. It's so critical. 
The last one, we need to increase access to quality feed all year round through the establishment of a vibrant commercial feed and product subsector, primarily driven by smallholder farmers as well as small, medium-sized uh, enterprises. And like I said earlier, we, we started to build a network of, of com uh, commercial feed producers because we are hoping that we need to really develop a business model for pastoral development and feed production in Nigeria for it to be sustainable. Thank you so much for listening to me. A bigger applause for him, please. Sahel Consulting, co-host for today's conference. Thank you very much. I would like to take a message from the sponsor. I'll call on Dr. Paul. Paul Makamasini. He's a divisional head, agribusiness, agribusiness, ideal. Sorry. Put your hands together for him, please. Good, um, good afternoon, ladies and um, gentlemen. Um, I would first want to start um, by thanking uh, the award of doctor that was just uh, conferred on me. Uh, prior to now, I was just Paul Makamasini and not doctor. But well, thank you anyway. Yes, so I'm here to um, make a presentation on the topic or a project that we're presently running in integrated dairies farms. The project is called the IDL Smallholder Dairy Development Project. It is a project uh, that is quite dear to me um, and also to my company. Quite dear to me because we have taken it far beyond just the um, conceptual stage. Uh, we're presently at the phase, second phase where we're at implementation and it has been quite a journey. And I look forward to taking you through this journey with me in this presentation. The project also resonates with the team of the World Milk Day, catalyzing a milk revolution in Nigeria through strategic investments in dairy development. As I take you through the presentation, I'll get to provide more clarity to this. My presentation is going to take the following format where I'll take you through an introduction, uh, see you through the smallholder model farm, objectives of the dairy model farm. Uh, afterwards, we'll look at the project implementation framework and the conclusion. Um, permit me once again, I know a lot, of, um, a lot of data has been thrown out here by the previous speakers, but in order for me to uh, appropriately capture this journey, I would still want to throw out one or two more, if I'm permitted. Sorry, this is quite small, so let me just open it on my tablet here. So like I mentioned earlier on, I would like to start with an introduction. And with my introduction, I would want to look at milk production. I would want to take you through three perspectives. I would first want to start with a global perspective, after which I will take you to a continental perspective, and then lastly close with a Nigerian perspective. With regards to milk production, the African perspective. Uh, in 2020, it was estimated about 49 million tons, which is about 5% of global milk output was generated in 2020. And mostly this was um, more of uh, the likes of countries of Kenya, um, Ethiopia, South Africa, amongst others. Next slide, please. In terms of the African perspective, Nigeria contributes 
to African population, about 13.4%, looking at global world population. But in the aspect of milk production, Nigeria produces basically about 1.1% in terms of the global world milk output. Nigeria is Africa's most populous nation with about 13.4% of its population. But this accounts for just 1.1% of the global milk. In terms of the national perspective, a lack of presence of Nigeria in the global and African milk production can be attributable immensely to the potential in the dairy sector. In Nigeria, the smallholder dairy farmer makes up the major constituent of the dairy upstream sector, majority of whom operates in unorganized or unstructured systems. Next slide, please. Looking at Nigeria's milk production versus consumption growth rate comparison, Nigeria averages milk production growth rate of about 2%, while Nigeria's average milk consumption growth rate is about 8%. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, there is a gap. And the question therein lies, how do we fill this gap? So in arriving at the IDL, smallholder dairy farmer project. Okay, I think you're not following. You've missed a couple of slides. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Yes, please. In arriving at the IDL smallholder dairy farm project, this was first conceptualized as a CRS project. We as a corporate organization consistently are thinking on how we impact our immediate environment. And what immediately stood out for us is looking at the level of unemployment in our surrounding environments, looking at the level that is more attributable to the youths. What can we conceptualize that can impact positively on these youths? We engaged on series of researches we looked at the Kenyan model, we looked at the Ugandan model, we looked at the Indian model, trying to see how this can be replicated in Nigeria, also taking into consideration our operational environment. Hence, we came up with the smallholder dairy farm. And what the smallholder dairy farm speaks to basically is looking at the community, uh, coming up with structures where individuals can be grouped and can have a model farm that is not so expensive, a model farm that is zero to semi-grazing, a model farm that is cost efficient, taking into consideration local materials that can be sourced within the environment. And in so doing this, a model farm was designed by IDL right before our farm. We took the initiative, we built this model farm off the various researches we had done to stand out as a model that will be replicated with all the farmers that will eventually be involved in the scheme. The model farm was designed to start with an initial size of uh, a herd size of five cows and projected that over a five year period, each smallholder farmer will be able to have grown his herd size to about, about, about uh, 13 cows. The model farm was designed also to raise animals through the different stages of growth in a controlled environment with minimal risk of diseases or disease outbreak. Next slide, please. So what exactly was the objective that we had in mind? We were looking at promoting and encouraging dairy farming in our local community. The first impression you have when you consider the environment in Jos or in Vom is mostly a farming community where you have the likes of vegetables thriving very well and uh, virtually very less of dairy farming. We looked at this as an opportunity where we, after building these model farms, we can bring these farmers to the model farm, educate them, on dairy best practices, 
show them how to go about running a model farm. And not just the aspect of running just the model farm, but also partnering with them at every phase of this transition to the extent that at the tail end, we're also off takers of whatever milk volumes they produce. So a key aspect for us was to promote and encourage dairy farming in the local community. We had various engagements, ranging from engagements with the local traditional title holders, having various town hall meetings, just to get the buyings of the farmers and to assure them that if they embark on this journey with us, it would be uh, not only a learning curve, but also a profitable journey to them. A second objective was in terms of capacity development and knowledge transfer. Like I made mention of in the smallholder dairy farmers, uh, a smallholder dairy farm, these farmers are exposed to dairy best practices. Practices ranging from breeding exercises to artificial insemination, to growing your own silage, to also to, to, to best practices in terms of milking. So as you get the desired quantity and you get the desired quality. We're also looking at strengthening the dairy value chain. What we have presently as indicated from the data I initially showed is that there's quite a gap. Um, I know at the last Kodaran meeting we had, there was some data that was presented in terms of milk imports from last year, 2021. And these figures were quite mind blowing. What we as a company brought to bear or brought to mind was that if we could start the smallholder uh, farmer, smallholder farmer project, it in due course can be replicated across board and you would not have such scenarios where you have companies engaging so much in exportation, uh, importation of dairy products, products that ordinarily we could provide for them, products that ordinarily the smallholder farmer can provide. So a key aspect for us was strengthening the dairy value chain. And what do we have when we, have the, when we look at the dairy value chain? We're looking at the um, typical farmer that's engaged in um, rearing of his cattle, be it for milk uh, production, be it for dairy production. Looking at infrastructure in the place that can take their final products to the processors enhancing the abilities of the processors to use these raw materials to produce their finished goods. We decided to concentrate more on how to support the smallholder farmers to the extent that they can boost their milk collection. We're also looking at employment creation and reduction of restiveness amongst our youth. On a daily basis, we're inundated with the level of unemployment in this ground, in this our country, Nigeria. What can we as a company do to create an avenue for individuals to be gainfully employed? Or even if not gainfully employed, but be owners of their businesses. And then lastly, we were also looking at conserving of conservation of foreign exchange earnings. Like I made mention of, the data with regards to what is spent on the importation of dairy products, if channeled down to local supplies here, would definitely have an impact on our environment. And aside that, we were also looking at financial inclusion. We constantly hear of CBN talking about banking the own banks. We constantly hear of CBN talking about how we can have clarity as to those participating within the financial sector. And what we had in mind is that when you have a smallholder farmer that's actively engaged in business, he's trading, definitely uh, there's an exchange of monetary gains. And with that, there has to be financial inclusions. And with financial inclusion comes exposures to all sorts of fundings from be it uh, government organizations down to intervention forms from foreign donors. So an ultimate goal was also to find a way of ensuring that most of these individuals were brought into the financial sector. Next slide, please. So in terms of implementation, where are we presently? Like I made mention of, 
We have passed the first stage and we are presently in the implement implementation phase. And with the implementation phase comes the implementation of our framework. Where we're looking at construction of the demo farms, replicating those demo farms on all the farms of the identified farmers. It is quite interesting to note that when we started this project, we had applications from just VOM, the VOM environment of over 600 farmers. And it was just not just about um, applying and saying you wanted to be involved because there has to come some level of commitment as well. In terms of any farmer involved in this project, you have to commit one hectare of land, which will be used for growing uh, the hair the silage that the cattle are supposed to feed on. And then aside that, it has been a series of community engagements. So over time, there are various criteria we had to put in place to ensure that the farmers that we set out to participate at this initiate, uh, initial part of the scheme were serious individuals. So at this point now, we're at the stage of replicating the um, farm structure at their various farms. Like I made mention, we've had various community engagements. We've gotten the buy-ins of the local authorities involved. We've gotten the commitments of the people. Aside the community engagement, we have the enlisting of the target beneficiaries. Like I made mention of, initially we had about well over 500 to 600 farmers, but being a pilot phase, we had to downsize this and decided to start with about 75 farmers. What other commitments have we, have we as a company also made? Next slide, please. IDL presently sits on a land space of about 550 hectares, which we use uh, partially for growing our hay and silage. Aside that, we also you have our processing plants, and we also have a wide range of paddocks to which the cattle actually feed on. We decided to commit about 20 hectares out of this land to farmers that co cannot commit to the one hectare, such that the land availability will not be a hindrance to them participating in the scheme. Also, we as a company have committed to working with them through this journey. We're involved at every step of the way. We're involved in the engagements with regards to financing. We're involved with the engagements with, this, with regards to the design of the, uh, the work framework. The framework. We're also engaged with regards to the purchase of the cattle. We as a company, our agribusinesses are involved in the importation of hybrid cement. So at every step of the way, there will be some level of artificial insemination, where at the end of a five-year period, you will have an average farmer involved that would have graduated his herd from a local to a Frisian, be it in the aspect of a, an F1, F2, but at the end of the day, they would have a hybrid cow, which will boost up a better production in terms of milk qualification or milk production. What did we also do? Like I made mention, initially, we were looking at this as a CSR project. But after the conceptualization, we knew that this was beyond us and it was something that could be replicated across board. So we took a step further to engage in conversations with the Central Bank of Nigeria. Prior to now, there has never been any intervention in the diary space. We've had interventions for, for, for rice milling, we've had interventions for maize, but none in the diary space. And we're proud to say as of today, we've gotten the buy-in of CBN. And as at present, we've had engagements with Nisa Microfinance and the funds have been disbursed through the Agric Small and Medium Enterprise Scheme, the Agmi Scheme. So the 75 farmers here identified have gotten their initial disbursement to start up this project. So with the disbursement, we move to the next phase, which is the implementation phase. With the implementation phase, it's like I made mention of, we know it's not going to be an easy journey, but it's a journey we've committed for to from the very start. We're going to be with these farmers all the way to the end. 
what we have structured for them is a five-year uh, uh, loan with a two-year moratorium. And it's expected within this two-year moratorium, they should have been able to take their cows to a level that the cows would start milking. We as IDEA will stand as the off-takers to the milk. But aside the milk being a source of income, they also, the, farmer, the average farmer also has other sources of income. As we know in dairy farming, uh, the bull cows are not necessarily needed since there will be artificial insemination here with us graduating from the F1s to the F2s till we attain the full fruition. So the average farmer, which at any point in time can dispose of the bull cows as a source of income. So like I made mention of, we're committed to this journey. Um, it is a project that resonates with what we're all discussing right here. We're proud as a company to have taken it beyond just the conceptual level to the implementation phase. It is the first of its kind in terms of an intervention in the diary space. And we understand that the regulators are watching this closely to ensure that it does work. And within the five year period, various appraisals will be done and the decision taken to replicate across board. So it will be an intervention that is not only uh, uh, applicable in JOS, but in due course, we would see various ranches across Nigeria having access to these fundings, having access to building up their smallholder farmers, and inevitably having access to better yield in terms of milk quality and quantity. So in conclusion, I would like to say, there's this saying that states, to go a distance, you can choose to walk alone, but to really go far, you need to walk together. So much is going to be discussed here today. So much has already been mentioned. But we really need to get the buy-in of virtually everybody seated here today. In various interactions, you hear statements such as, uh, we need uh, the government intervention, we need the CBN's help. But we just clearly want to state here that it also starts with us. It also starts with us coming up with an idea. It also starts with us be about being passionate about what we intend to attain. So at the end of this, I would want to plead and hope again your commitment that as we live here, we'll strive to ensure that we increase investment in local milk production and collection. The regulators here present will continue to push for a stable regulatory environment. I know there have been various discussions with regards to the national diary policy. We are glad that it's getting to the tail end and we're looking at it coming into legislation. A commitment also to speed up infrastructural development to improve operational environments. We have had various discussions around meal collection centers. This involves a lot of infrastructure. What can we do within the space within which we operate? What can we do as specialists to upscale in terms of animal breed improvements? such why we have the best breeds that can provide the desired quality and quantity in milk to fill up the gaps that were earlier identified in the statistics that were shown. Better extension services to the smallholder farmer, access to finance, and then finally, capacity building and training. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and I wish every one of us here a happy World Milk Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for him once more. Our next speaker, before he makes his, his way to the podium, I'll give us a brief bio on him, Dr. Ayola Shoyombo, who will be giving us a presentation on the importance of data in dairy sector transformation lessons from for Nigeria. Dr. Ayola Shoyombo teaches courses focused on animal science, biotechnology, and statistics at Landback University, Para, as an Australian trained 
reproductive biotechnologist. Dr. Dr. Sharon Bo majors in animal embryology, genetics, and breathing with special bias for cattle and dairy production. He is the initiator and coordinator of Landmark University Cattle Cooperative and Artificial Insemination Initiative, where he has continued to showcase rare brilliance and innovations in animal production and biotechnology. He studied animal production and health at the Federal University of Agriculture at Beikuta, formerly known as University of Agriculture at Beikuta. He holds a Master's of Animal Production, MTech, Animal Reproduction Physiology from the Federal University of Technology, Mina, Niger State, and a PhD in Animal Science, Animal Genetics and Breeding from the Amadou Bello University, Zaria in 2008 and 2012, respectively. He lectured in the University of Abuja in the Department of Animal Science from 2012 to 2015. I'm sure when I was reading this biography, you were expecting a Wallace Shoyin looking somebody to mount the podium. Please put your hands together with this very rich biography. Welcome, Dr. Shoyombo. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be very brief with this presentation because again, um, seeing that we started behind schedule, and um, I'm going to move with the speed of light. Um, first, I want to thank God for keeping us and giving us health to this day. You quite agree with me that um, for you to actually be in the dairy sector or to be in the cattle business, you need enough energy. So for strength, I want to say thank you, God, and um, especially recognize some of my teachers seated here. I would want to see when I got this invitation, of course, um, I was like, what am I going to say in the presence of those that taught me? But of course, they gave me the go ahead to so. Professor so Yayi, I want to say you're welcome, sir. Um, my prof from Futmina, um, you're welcome, sir. Now I want to especially recognize the presence of um, the director, um, um, husbandry services, um, Dr. Mrs. Winnie, you're highly recognized, ma'am. Now, again, I'm going to speak like one, a lecturer in the university now. I'm going to also speak um, as a geneticist, because of course you agree with me that if you give any other field of animal science this particular topic, he's going to speak from his own angle where he has expertise. And I'm going to speak again as a breeder, uh, sorry, as a header, because um, today is one of the days I didn't see my animals before starting the day's work. So that is to say, I'm actually, I, I stay with animals on a daily basis. Um, yes, the next slide. The next slide. Well, this will be my presentation outline. We're going to be looking about the global outlook, um, dairy sector in Australia. Somebody will say, why Australia? I'm conversant with Australia. I did my postdoctoral um, degree in Australia. I know a lot about the dairy sector in Australia. One day, so one of my students asked me, he said, um, they call me Dr. Shu on campus. He said, um, who do you love best, your animals or your wife? I said, my wife. Why? Because um, I'm actually obsessed with cattle. And I can tell you, on, camp, on campus at the moment, we have about 400 heads of cattle um, that we, we, we deal with. And I can tell you categorically things that happen when it comes to cattle and cattle breeding. So we'll talk about dairy farm. Um, we'll talk about dairy sector in Africa. We'll talk about dairy sector in Nigeria, data collection, and then recommendations. And then we'll move, I'll leave the podium. Next slide. So let's look at the global dairy sector. A lot of persons have come here. If you bring 20 more people here, they will give you different data, different from what I'm going to give you. But again, the joy about it is that the differences are not significant because different um, people, different persons responsible for data collection will collect their data differently. And that will also bring about variation from figures you will see on the net. Um, so I said in 2019, global dairy was estimated to be 720 billion US dollars, of course. That's, and then the value, projected grew to about, will grow to about 1,032 billion. Of course, if we keep increasing, and the majority of dairy products are made with cow's milk. You also have other animals that give you milk, but of course, that of cow is, um, is the one we're talking about, and that is the one that um, has this particular figure we're talking about.
Why? They have better producing dairy animals. So it is not in the number. It is in the quality. Now, I just gave a pictorial diagram of um, the major producers of cow. Permit me to move closer to my slides. Um, the major producers of cow milk worldwide as of 2021, that's the current. And then you will see where um, um, you see European Union, you see United States, India, even though India has um, the largest number, but it's not producing the largest quantity, showing that they are, um, they are, they are dairy breeds, they are not as productive as, um, next slide. Now let's talk about dairy sector in Australia. What happens in Australia? Because of course, all our stay, um, again, I want, to be, I want to say that our director here, um, Animal Husband and Services is also an alumni of Australia. And um, at the moment, I'm the vice president of that particular association in Nigeria. So we have been there and then we can speak to what actually happens in Australia. You see that dairy sector in Australia is one of Australia's most important industries. And then it gives about 8.8 .8 billion liters of milk in 2018 to 2019. Um, and of course, it's able to I, I employ about 46,200 people. You can see that data is so huge. Next slide. Now, they are able to do that with the help of this Dairy Farm Monitor Project. Now, the, what are the things that the Dairy Farm Monitor Project does? One, it registers farms and then the trends, um, the number of dairy cows at the national, the regional, and so on and so forth, the breeds. In Australia, they have a whole um, lot of breeds. And of course, um, some of these um, breeds are monitored by the DFMP, and um, the DFMP will also look at the milk output, um, inputs, that is, uh, what are you actually feeding the animal? Are you feeding them grains? Is it grass? Because of course, in developed countries, just like we know, you, 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 the, the demand for dairy based on so many factors. They will tell you, I want dairy from a grass-fed cattle. Some, of, some other person will tell you that I want dairy from a grain-fed cattle. Unlike Nigeria that you don't actually um, consider whatever. Milk is milk. Are we together? So in developed countries, um, this particular DFMP in Australia will, con will monitor how many animals were raised with the grains, how many were raised with um, the grass, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Um, it will also monitor current heart size and production, the head production per count, um, regional profile for anticipated production change, the increase, decrease, and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Now, use of DF, all dairy farmers, what are the, the major use of DFMP is that all dairy farmers have access to that data. Why? It helps them to monitor what they are doing and to assess themselves, even before the government comes to um, um, tell them what they are doing, either right or wrong. So all dairy farmers have access to the data. They also compare their own farm business performance with the available data to know if they are doing well or they are not doing well. And then another use of the um, DFMP is that it identifies areas for improvement. So you can see the coordinated um, package that has been put in place in their dairy sector. Now let's quickly talk about dairy sector in Africa. Now, if you look at this particular chart, you find out that Ethiopia produces um, or has um, the highest cattle population next to Chad, Sudan, Tanzania, Kenya, and then Nigeria with about 20.7. As are the last statistics. Next slide. I said, this sector, the highest milk producing countries in Africa are Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, and Sudan. Ethiopia has the most cows. South Africa has the greatest milk production per cow. What does that tell you? That even though Ethiopia has the largest number, South Africa again produces the highest quantity. As I speak with you, we have what we call the South African hosting that is synonymous to that or that produces very close to the host thing you have in Netherlands. As we go forward, uh, I'll tell you some of the things that made that. So South Africa has the greatest milk production in, in, um, in South Africa. Um, South Africa has the highest milk production, even though they are not the owners or they don't have the highest number of them. And I said only Ethiopia and Kenya are self-sufficient. What does this tell you? It simply means that Ethiopia and Kenya are the only two countries in which production meets or exceeds demand. It, these are the two countries in which their dairy production meets or exceeds local demand. So it is only Ethiopia and Kenya 
out of all this, even South Africa that has the highest production, they still need, they still need probably because of um, some other things they put their dairy into or because of exp um, export and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Now, dairy sector in Africa, it simply means that opportunity exists for expansion throughout Africa. There is need for us and we can actually expand. Two different dairy industry models within Africa. We'll, we'll look at that of the modern South Africa and then we'll look at the small older Kenya. Now, for large firms or coordinated firms, like um, I was speaking with the, the MD um, Promacido this morning. Um, of course, very close to our school. I visit their farm from time to time. And he was telling me so many things, which he, because I told him we're having a meeting and then, um, and this time is, so he was telling me, he gave me a, 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 a long list of challenges they are actually facing. So when we get there, I can share some of those things we spoke about this morning. Two different dairy industry models um, exist within Africa. The, the modern, South Africa modern and the smallholder. Um, I'm happy a lot, a lot of um, speakers have actually spoken about some of these models. But of course, for coordinated and for large industries, um, the IDL, um, Friesland Campina, um, Promacido, and so on and so forth, Allah, they will be better to use the South African model because, of course, again, um, the model will suit their own production pattern better. While for a small scale um, or small household dairy um, producers, we we'll use the Kenyan model. Now, the South Africa has good data structure. Of all these um, African countries, you find that the South Africa pro provides the best data structure. And then South African processors, organizations, they're able to do some of these things they are doing in South Africa through Sampro and then um, MPO, milk producers, and then milk essays. Next. Now let's quickly talk about dairy sector in Nigeria. And this is my major concern. I just needed to give us a Despite the 20.7 million cattle population in Nigeria, Nigeria spends 570 billion naira yearly importing dairy products. Why? One, our cattle, now let me correct an impression. Some persons will say our animals are of poor genetic quality. No, our animals are not poor genetic quality. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that if you bring an exotic breed of cattle to Nigeria, and you subject them to the harsh and kind of treatment our animals go through, they will not survive. If you take our animals to any of these countries and you put animals, they will still perform. What is the implication? It simply means that our animals are good, they are rugged, they have superior breeding characteristics, just that our animals are predominantly non-dairy breeds. Are we together? Why will the, um, these figures continue to increase? Researchers have not done their best. That is the truth. We in academics, we have not done the best. We have not put in our best. Another reason is simply because um, um, dairy industries have, again, given lip service. Nobody will help our country except we help ourselves. If truly all these dairy industries that are coming to Nigeria and making a lot of um, um, advocacies, if they are sincere, why have they not put up physical infrastructures that will help improve our... We expect them to have, by now, put up um, artificial information training centers where they can actually give hands-on training to our technicians. And that is the truth. I was with the Australian um, um, Deputy High Commissioner some three, four weeks ago, and I told him to his face at a meeting in Abuja that this is, and this, and this, it's not just for us, for you to give us money to organize symposium and come and talk about financial inclusion, put tangible things that we can actually do or put our, 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 our youth, our population into that will increase our dairy, um, dairy sector. Next slide. Now, if you look at Nigeria and Australia, look at the human population. Nigerian human population is about 200 million with about 20.7 20, 20. million of cattle. If you divide this, you know what that is saying. But look at Australia. And then for, uh, for Nigeria, I'm talking about all our cattle. But for Australia, I'm talking about the dairy cattle alone. So they have about 26 million heads of dairy cattle and about 28 million, I'm um, sorry, 26 million um, population, human population, and about 28 million dairy cattle. You can see the difference. So we are actually 
um, have a role to play there. Next slide. Now, data collection in the dairy sector. Why data collection? It is for comparison of comprehensive, compilation of comprehensive information. For us to actually have a true picture of what is happening and how it is happening or why it is happening, we need um, data collected. For general performance of different breeds, for cross-breeding program, for investment, and then guide to veterinary health services. Of course, if you look at the Kenyan model, the Netherlands government have really helped in developing their dairy sector because they actually have something to show. Are we together? Now, if we have to move from where we are now, we need to collect data. Who are those that will collect data? AI technicians, animal scientists, veterinary doctors, slaughterhouses, milk laboratories, farmers, and extension officers. All these people will actually help to collect the data. The next, what are the types of data we actually need? One, data on general health. We need the milk, dairy, daily milk quantity. Then the UDA health, the Calvin, the next slide. Other data will include longevity, the calf survival, adaptability, factor of foreign breeds, the feed efficiency ratio, the feed conversion ratio, and so many other data. These are all data that will be needed for our dairy sector to actually move from where it is to now. In the operations of data collection, we will actually put this data into the national data, which will provide information across the different regions of the country. Of course, you know that the animals are not evenly distributed across every region. So we will need data based on um, um, the regions or geopolitical zones. Then we also need individual farm data, which is specifically related to farmers' peculiarity. Next slide. The need for Nigerian Dairy Data Bank. All this data that will be collected will actually go to a particular data bank where anybody that needs anything from Nigeria can actually have, because you don't expect, if Promacido wants to get um, data for Nigerian Dairy Industry, you don't expect him to now begin to go from farm to farm to collect data. Again, that will not give him a true picture. So there is need for the um, data bank. Now, what is the way forward? Awareness orientation and reorientation of current highest dairy producers. We understand that 95% of the milk produced in Nigeria is in the hands of the pastoralists. And the pastoralists do not really believe in many of the things we do. For example, I do artificial insemination virtually on a weekly basis in, on campus. And my full animal that in charge of my animal, anytime the animals come um, become pregnant, they will say, Dr. I has impregnated a cattle. They make jest of me. What does that mean? They don't really believe in what we are doing. So we need awareness, orientation, and reorientation of highest of, of current highest dairy producers, which are the we need to let them understand, carry them along from time to time what we are doing and make them see the difference. I will tell you again that some of them, when they when these cows come, they treat those cows with um with different with different um, they give them different, they are not really happy. That's the truth about it with some of these things, except some of them that have gotten enough awareness and have been able to understand that, yes, this is the way to go. Then we also need training and retraining of personnel involved in data collection. Increase your dairy cattle hard number through artificial, artificial uh, sorry, ART, assisted reproductive technologies. Many farms today, we still do natural mating. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of genetics, and then we can't really go anywhere from there. We need to carry out assisted reproductive technologies, which include artificial insemination, multiple ovulation and embryo transfer. Even at this point, there is nothing bad if Nigeria at the moment will begin to practice in vitro fertilization, IVF on cattle. These are little, little technologies that, are, that, that, that should be at the fingerprint of every stakeholder. If we have um, AI centers and we have technicians there, they'll be able to, and that will help to speed up our genetics and then um, um, get to where we want to get to. Um, we have to do selection and reselection of desired traits, crossbreeding with capable exotic dairy breeds. Now, one of the challenges we are having in this country is that most of these um, organized dairy, dairy farms bring in exotic breeds to this country. When the last batch of the um, animals came from US to Ikun Dairy Farm, I was privy to it. And I, and I interacted with the manager who is a Zimbabwean. 
that one of the things you need to do first is to see how you are going to cross this exotic breed with our local breeds. So you get F1 that are 50-50 genetically. What most of them have observed want to do is to maintain those exotic breeds, but it's not going to work like that from genetics point of view. The first thing we should be thinking of is how to cross this exotic breed that are local to get the F1 that will begin to, and then do a back cross to upgrade. If we do a back cross and we upgrade, in the third generation, we have that same breed, but that would have genetically adapted to Nigeria. And that's exactly what we do. But many of them will bring these exotic breeds and begin to create microclimate. He still mentioned it this morning. And begin, begin to create micro, how much you are going to be raising your cost of production. You are going to be spending so much. And at the end of the day, there is no way because these things are genetically manipulated. And that's why we talk about South, Af South African hosting. So we must begin to do what? Do crossbreeding with contact, compatible exotic breeds, um, continuous upgrading, and then desired gene will be stabilized. And of course, we'll be very close to where we need to go. Next slide, please. Now, I'll quickly round up with this um, recommendation for Nigeria. Set up a Nigerian dairy monitor project. Whatever name we are going to call it, I wouldn't know. Why? To ensure adequate data availability and accessibility. That is why we are going to set it up. By who? By the Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, by NIAS, by Coderan, by Agri Society of Nigeria, and every other stakeholder. How? Model after DFP Australia or which other model will be appropriate. Um, and then regulate the process of data collection by all players. Then we should we also need to provide independent data around a wide range of on-farm practices, which could um, be which could help in decision making. Um, reg regulators must start with registration of dairy farm in Nigeria. Encourage smallholder dairies in Kenya. Of course, if you look at the smallholder dairy in Kenya, you have households up to about 600 smallholder dairies. The same way our mothers here keep chicken, one, two, three chicken. That is how they keep cattle. In, 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 in Kenya. So therefore, we need to encourage smallholder dairies in, 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 in Nigeria, just like you have in Kenya. Then let us also institutionalize our data collection model. What do I mean by this? The way Amana data is collected by Promacido may not suit the way Amana data will be collected in my university because of our level of operation. So we need to institutionalize what works for you. The way, to, the way you collect data for Promacido will not be the same way data will be collected by the person that owns three. So you look at what works for them um, across ge geopolitical zones, across states, local government, and then farms. Next slide. Um, all stakeholders, government, academic researchers, animal producers, scientists, headsmen, ETC, should come together and make a dairy sector work. And the last slide. I want to thank you for giving me the audience to say one or two things. Thank you and God bless. As a true lecturer, he came and he lectured. Please put your hands together for him once more. If you look at your program, we're get, getting to the point of a panel discussion. Okay, yes. Um, Hodoran wants to appreciate uh, Dr. Shoyombo or Dr. Shoyo. That was a very, very rich presentation. And I think it's a well-deserved recognition and appreciation for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Doctor. Put your hands together for him, please. It's now time for the panel discussion. And um, I'll be calling on Mr. Temi Adegoroye to take over at this point. He's going to be the moderator of the panel discussion session.
He's the managing partner, Sahel Consulting Agriculture, Nutrition and Nutrition Limited. And if you notice, once again, they are the co-host for today. So it's not out of place for him to be handling the mic and moderating the panel session. Um, I'll be calling the panelists to the stage, please. Mr. Shei Shekari, MD CEO Integrated Dairies Limited. Mr. Shekari is in the house. Yes, please come to the stage. Put your hands together for him, please. Joining him is Mrs. Winnie Lai Sholari. Director, Department of Animal Husbandry Services, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Put your hands together for her, please. I would also like to invite Mr. Anthony Alkosefi. I hope I got it right. General Manager, Delhi First Caterers Nigeria Limited. Please. Put your hands together for him one more time. Joining them on stage also is Mr. Deji Adebusoye. He is a principal Sahel Capital. Mr. Deji Adebusoye, please. Oh yes, he's joining us online. Yes, he's online. Please put your hands together for him. Can you hear us? Yes, good afternoon. If I can Mr. Hear you. Can Digi you? can hear us, maybe you just say something so that we'll know he's there. Okay, yes, he's there. <laughs> we can see yeah, his face Good now. afternoon. Can you hear me? Thanks for joining. So at this point, I'll be handing over the mic to Mr. Ade Goroye to take over from here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, once again. And uh, you're welcome to the panel discussion session. I uh, this session promises to be uh, a very insightful one. Uh, I'm very confident of that because, uh, as you can see, I, I call this a power panel. Uh, you know, we have the the leaders and captains of captains of industry within the dairy landscape in Nigeria. We have the we have uh, her, her amazing uh, Madam Winnie, who has been doing a lot of work in, in the policy uh, landscape uh, for dairy and livestock in general. And of course, we have our investment guru, uh, Deji uh, Adibusoe, who is joining us from, I think Deji is currently out of the country. Deji, can, 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 sorry, can you give Deji uh, volume and, and voice? Deji, when you speak, we, we don't hear you. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry, can you increase the volume a little bit? Okay. okay. All right, so uh, let's just start right away. Um, and I want us to be as uh, quick and precise as possible so that we allow people who are sitting uh, in the room to be able to also contribute and we probably ask questions or make comments. A lot has been said today, and I, I think I won't you know, repeat many of the things that have been said. We've looked at the data, we've looked at the statistics, we've, we've looked at some of the challenges, you know, we've, we now understand there are quite a number of challenges that are really staring at us in the face and the need for us to increase you know investment private private investment in the dairy sector of course the need for us to also sort of recalibrate i'm so sorry uh, someone's supposed to join you on stage here to is a panelist also please uh, my apologies for that i'd like to invite mr paul ojo chief operating officer l and z integrated Farms. He's representing Al Haji MD Abubakar, the MD and CEO of LNZ Integrated Farms. Please put your hands together for him. Please. Once again, we are sorry, we apologize for that oversight. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Paul. Apologies. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, we've seen you know, issues around you know, policy, issues around insecurity, you know, migration, uh, milk productivity of our cows. So there are quite a number of things that we need to talk about. And I would like us to hear from uh, these uh, distinguished uh, people on the panel today, uh, you know, their perspectives around the dairy sector in Nigeria and, you know, one of the things, some of the things they are doing. So I think as I, as I pass the microphone, 
uh, just quickly introduce yourself again and let us understand what you are doing within your organization to really you know, support the dairy sector. For some of us from the private sector, it will be good to hear from you, you know, some of the investment that you've made, uh, you know, your business model, your vision for you know, the, the dairy landscape in Nigeria. And of course, uh, Madam Winnie will be talking to us about you know, some of the efforts of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture uh, to ensure that we have a, a very vibrant, inclusive, uh, enabling environment for, for that supports dairy production in the country. So I, I would we'll go around uh, just a minute each to, to talk about that. Deji, so uh, we'll go first with the people uh, within, the, within the hall, and then uh, after that, you. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Shane Shakari. I'm the MD of Integrated Dairies Limited and also the uh, treasurer of Kodaran. Um, at Integ Integrated Dairies, we operate along the whole value chain. We, um, we farm for the animals, feed the animals, uh, milk, process, and deliver uh, to the um, various um, retail outlets around the country. Um, I think on our own side, um, we've... Um, We've tried to um, grow the um, local production through a partnership with Sahel on one side. At the same time, too, we've also tried to um, start our own small, half, small uh, farmer projects, which um, was presented earlier on by uh, Mr. Paul Sini. Um, it's been a difficult journey, but um, I think with what is happening around the country today, that, that is the only way forward. When you look at what the cost of imported milk today is and what the cost of local milk is out there, there's actually no other choice but to uh, boost this uh, milk production. The latest uh, calculation I did, um, I think cost of a liter of milk, if you're using powdered milk, is probably around 300 naira per liter. Right now, um, I think we're collecting generally around the country. I think milk is collected at about 200 naira, I believe, uh, per liter. In some places, maybe slightly lower. Um, um, other places, maybe just maybe 10 naira or so higher. But on the average, it's about 200 liters per, per naira. Uh, sorry, 200 lit uh, naira per liter. So I think to move forward, we need to push this sector. Even your, I mean, your production costs will be much lower just following this uh, particular model of collecting milk from the, uh, from the local farmers. Yes, there's the challenge of um, uh, cooling. Yes, there's the challenge of uh, reaching out to all those remote areas to get the milk. But I think once we're able to organize them better, once we're able to put the investment that's needed to keep this milk in um, good condition, I think it will work better for, for everybody, both you as a processor or um, the country as a whole. So um, just to save time, I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Good afternoon all. My name is Paul Ojo. I represent MD Awobakar, the MDC of LNZ Integrated Farms, Kano, and also the president of uh, Kodaran. Uh, in LNZ, um, we are also a full uh, dairy uh, manufacturing uh, outfit, the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream end of dairy, we are deeply involved. Uh, moving forward, we are looking at how we can empower people so as to focus on our core competency. How do you do that? Is by identifying smallholders, training them, giving them the capacity and the competence, then bringing them together as cooperatives, then incentivizing by putting maybe milk collection centers, that would be the midstream, then we, we as processors will go harvest the milk from the milk collection centers to the processing outfit, and then we process and eventually uh, send to the table. Uh, a lot have been said uh, about milk. That is why we are here. If I may ask, uh, what is milk? Do we really know what milk is? If I may throw in a poser, can you tell us the difference between pasteurized milk, sterilized milk, evaporated milk, fat-filled milk, full cream milk, 
whole milk? Can anybody, do we know what we are actually giving to ourselves or giving to our children? Coincidentally, milk is the first thing that all mammalian forms are given. It is not by error. It is because milk contains the 20 essential amino acids that is needed for the upgrowth of any mama. And unfortunately, these amino acids cannot be synthesized by the human body. And milk is the cheapest or the most readily available source of such amino acids. Can you go into the market all in the name of drinking milk or yogurt and you buy a yogurt, a bottled yogurt that has been displayed in the sun for hours, days, and months, and you still carry it to your house and feed it to your children? Have you tried buying milk from the Fulani woman and bottle it and put it in the sun and see whether it will last for 24 hours? So if you go and buy yogurt or milk that has been displayed in the sun for days, weeks, and months, and you are taking it, there's other two things. It's either it is not milk, or it, it is milk that has been spiked by cancerous preservatives. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, you might say it's coming expensive, but at the same time, if, if you must live and be healthy, there is a premium attached to it. You look around now, there's a lot of kidney failures, there's a lot of cancer, and a lot of foreign things that were not in, in our climes. Uh, the purpose of this sitting, this gathering, is to make sure that milk is readily available, wholesome milk is readily available, and at a cheaper cost for all. Milk is valuable. I'm going to stop uh, here. There's many other things that will come. Thank you. Uh, maybe I was hoping this mic won't get to me. Um, first and foremost, I'm very happy to be here. And I thank the organizers for inviting us. Um, as federal government and as federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, particularly Animal Husbandry Services Department, the dairy sector is one of those sectors that is capable of bringing all the efforts of government to the fore. But we have not done much, or we have not done as much as we would like to. I don't know if I should start, if I should start listing what we have done. Maybe I will start with what we are yet to do. Because that way it will help us as we find solutions. I know that we have a lot of efforts in the private sector. As government, we have not been able to coordinate that. People are still working, companies are still working in silos. And so it's difficult for us to document nationally what we are doing. Dr. Sho said it, we don't have data. So it is when I come, you, if I look at, if I woke up with the, the left side of the bed, I'll give you one data. And if another person woke up from the other side or is reading another literature, we don't have data. We cannot say for sure what is happening in the dairy sector in Nigeria. It's a very, very big challenge. So while we are doing so much, when you talk about national data, we cannot plot our data like you see. So we have guesstimates all over, or data that is lying in the shelves of private, um, private, uh, say farmers or uh, private companies. That's one. The other one is how to harness the milk that we know we are producing in the country. 
if you do the if you do the the calculation and you say 95% of our animals are in the hands of the pastoralists how many percent of those ones are dairy cows and then how many do we have how many are we collecting from you will agree with me that we have a lot of waste a lot of milk being either poured away or processed in a way that the producers, the, the pastoralists and the smallholder farmers can manage. And then you have the private modern processing facilities still importing milk in a country of plenty. That again is a big, big challenge. How do we reach the producers, the smallholder producers, how can we get them into cooperatives? How can we link them to processors? Big challenge. I don't think we are doing enough. Yes, we have a lot of milk collection centers lying everywhere in the country. Some begging for people to come and operate them. Again, we don't have that, um, that strength to pull the processors and link them to these areas. Another challenge that I see so staring us in the face is that of capacity building, ability to relate with the smallholder farmers and make sure that they have extension services. Livestock extension in this in, in Nigeria, I think is it's supposed to be one to, depending, like I said, depending on the literature you are reading again, um, supposed to be one to 800, you will see in some places. In Nigeria, I think it's one to, you know what? Because it does not, most of the time, we don't have them. So that's another challenge. And so there are people who are constantly wasting their milk because they, they, they cannot meet the, the standard of the off takers. So this is another area that I think we should be looking at. The, or the final one before I very happily pass this mic is the constant struggle we see between the multinationals and the local or indigenous companies. The multinationals are very strong. We see it all the time. They are very strong. Sometimes you are trying to address an issue and before you know it, they are already talking to the, the powers that be and wanting to compel you to do what you know that will not benefit your country. That's a big challenge for me. We've had that battle on and on. And then of course, we all know about the national dairy policy and the battle is still on on that dairy policy. Um, I don't know if I should ask for prayers, but we do know that we will, with Coderan, we need the support of Coderan and all the indigenous players to push that policy and ensure that that policy sees the light of day. Um, these are the areas that we have challenges. Uh, outside this, we have done quite a lot, but we have been talking about what we have done. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony al -Kusayfi. I'm the general manager of the Leaf Skaters Nigeria Limited. Our company is specialized in the distribution, storage, and selling of frozen and chilled food items. So we barely have any item that is shelf stable or that is a dry item that we can put on the table for the whole day. We have uh, multiple brands across several categories, uh, both uh, local and a few imported ones. We as a company, we started to work on the daily backward integration project a couple of years ago, and we have successfully launched our brand into the Nigerian market almost one year ago. Also, our factory and processing plant for daily, uh, for daily products uh, is about to come online uh, Q3 this year. 
we as a company uh, look at the dairy uh, problem in Nigeria as a challenge for us, as well as the other players in Kodaram. Uh, basically, we know for a fact that there are lots of farmers, so we don't have a problem in the manpower. We know that we have lots of cows and we have a good cattle, not the best, but we have a cattle at least. The main challenge from our own perspective is that we have lots of milk that is not finding its way properly to the final consumer on the shelves of the supermarkets or the shops or the restaurants. And this is where we want to interfere, uh, of course, with the help of Kodaram and the other players in the market so that we can close this gap and we can have a proper supply chain from the farmer to the proper processing plant and of course with the cold chain and the proper logistic so that the milk and the dairy derivative can find its way uh, to uh, the final consumer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have to, to manage one microphone. Uh, it will be good for us to have another one. Uh, Deji, well, I'm coming to you. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself and just go uh, straight to talk about some of the, you know, we talked about the, 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 the theme around these, uh, you know, conference is really around backward integration. How can we, you know, achieve effective backward integration in Nigeria to make sure that we can actually, you know, formalize some of the existing local structures that we have uh, and, you know, to attain sufficiency in milk production. But of course, you'd agree with me that that comes with significant investment. And you know, you as an investment professional, you know, the work, great work that Sahel Capital is doing, it would be good to hear from you, you know, how Sahel Capital has responded to this uh, or is responding to these and some of the options that are available to uh, entrepreneurs in this space. Yeah, thanks, um, Timmy. Can you hear me? We can, can hear you uh, not, not, so, not so loud. Sorry, is there something you can do with the volume? Hello, can, can you hear me now? Is it better if I raise my voice? No. Did you just go ahead? They're, they're trying to, to, to fix okay. it, to increase. Okay, um, first of all, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and good afternoon to all the panelists. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Deji Adibusoye, and I'm a principal with Sahel Capital. Um, Sahel Capital is a system company to Sahel Consulting. So we, 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 many people use, confuse us with each other, but we are actually, we are sisters, but we are different. Um, so we are a private investment firm, and um, we, we invest in the food and agribusiness space through two funds that we over, oversee, uh, one called Parfine, invests in in Nigeria and the other called CIFA, which invests in 13 other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, the way we think about investment is um, not just to provide capital, but we all, always like to bring to, along with that capital, our technical, commercial, and um, financial expertise, you know, to enable and support the companies that we invest in to scale and to grow. Um, so um, it happens that one of the first investment that we made in Nigeria is actually L and Z. Uh, Paul Ojo is sitting. Uh, we've been together for quite a quite a while now, uh, since 2014, that we've invested in the company. And um, I think to, to most people who are sitting here today, you can attest to the to the phenomenal growth that L and Z has experienced over the last four to five years, and that has partly being because um, there was capital requirements and the need we met, um, you know, but then the team that was on ground as well, there was the passion, there was the, there was the knowledge, the expertise that they brought to bear as well. And, you know, capital combined with the passion and interest to grow the sector, I think was a very good thing. So, um, you know, to your question, Timmy, um, how do we think about that backwards integration? I think for us, there is a very interesting space for many reasons that, the panelists have all shared, whether it's in terms of how important it is for our health, whether it's in terms of um, the 
the, the, how unstructured it is. For some people, you see lack of structure and you see a problem. We see the lack of structure and we see there is an opportunity here um, that can be unnessed. So one of the things that we did, and I'm sure Paul will talk more about this uh, because he's more in the know, is when we invested in L and Z, there were two ways in which um, you know, they could build that backwards integration. It's either they are building out their own farm, you know, with um, exotic cows, or they are working with the already existing uh, herds of cows that are available in the country supplying milk. Unfortunately, you can't do one or either, at least in their case. So part of the capital that we put in the company, actually some of it went to help develop the um, the cow, the, the their own herd size, as well as the infrastructure to care for them. Uh, but in addition to that, we also were looking at how can we build out on the existing supply of milk in the market that nobody is nursing. So we're able to build out a more or less what in, is better known as outgrower programs, but working with pastoralists, you know, within the region to organize them into areas around collection centers and to be able to collect and uptake milk from them. The reality, like you said, is it's a very cost uh, intensive operation. And one of the things that we like to, um, how we like to think about the space is how can we get players that will focus on different part of the value chains and provide those services on a scale that will be material to all the players in the, in the environment. I will give you a good example. Um, Anthony is sitting down. One of the things that um, Delhi Frost has been able to do is to build a, log a cold chain of uh, logistics, which can provide services across the entire spectrum. And, you know, we like those kind of, because at the end of the day, if you go to other clients, other countries, you realize that what we are doing combined in one company in Nigeria has already been distributed across a lot of players and a, a lot of, um, you know, actors in the market. And as a result, they are able to, they are more efficient, they're able to drive more productivity in what they are doing. So that's one of the ways you think about it. But I know we are still some way off from there and there will be some significant investments, you know, to get there. And we are passionately looking for those actors and those players that we can support and back to help integrate that entire supply chain. Thanks very much, JG. Uh, thanks for, for those very great insights. Uh, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I, I think, you know, Thinking through investment within the dairy sector, you know, um, thinking about backward integration and how we can actually, you know, make that, you know, useful for, you know, our objective as a, as a nation for, for, for increased dairy production. Uh, there are quite a number of models that you could consider. I, I think we've heard from the different CEOs of, of, of these companies that are really working hard and making a lot of investment in this space, how they're thinking about it. So one thing is to think through it from an integrated perspective, similar to what they talked about with L and Z and how you know their investment with L and Z and collaboration has actually helped them to build different aspects of that business. You know, from actual production of milk to really you know setting up outgrower structures for pastoralists and really building an integrated operation. And also, I think they also alluded to what you know Anthony is doing with Delhi Frost and how they've been able to build some sort of you know, supply chain, you know, capability to make sure that that really supports dairy. So really, it's either we're thinking about it from an integrated perspective or we're thinking about it from really zeroing in on a particular aspect of the chain and building a very strong, uh, you know, capacity to be able to, you know, offer service or deliver. Uh, one of those things could actually add up to you know, we're achieving the, the, the desired objectives and goals that we, we've set for ourselves. Uh, please, as we speak, as the panelists, you know, speak through these questions and share these insights, please do, you know, note your, your comments and, and your questions because we'll definitely come to you uh, to share some of those or ask some of those questions. I will go back to the private uh, companies uh, represented on the, on, the, on the panel, just for you to share two things. And I'm going to be combining two questions in one. Uh, the first one is it would be good for us to understand, you know, how your current investments in the sector uh, is really impacting that sector uh, in terms of milk production, you know, collection, even livelihood improvement, uh, you know, for the, the key actors on the ground. Now I'm talking about, you know, pastoralists that you're collecting milk from their communities and even job, job creation. So how is your current investment really 
you know, making him part within the, within the sector. And the, the second leg to that question will be for you to, you know, suggest or recommend some investments, you know, ideas around, you know, what, what if we have an investor or a potential investor in this, in this room today, what do you think they should really be doing? Because I think the opportunity within that space is huge enough, you know, to still allow us to welcome a lot more people who can actually invest in different aspects. So what, what are those ideas that you can you know, possibly share with other uh, people within the room? I would go from uh, Shane, that then we'll go just from there. You're still right. Okay, we'll come back to you. Good afternoon. Um, we in LRZ uh, will tell you how uh, it started and where we are and where we hope to be uh, soon. Um, so far, we've identified over a thousand households of um, HADAS. Uh, we also have some commercial farmers. So what we do is to try to uh, group them into um, cooperatives. And then we've also tried to incentivize and encourage youths to come up as milk aggregators. So we've identified some high yielding milk zones and we've gone to those areas and established milk collection centers, which is powered by solar. And we have uh, cooling tanks there that can take uh, raw milk and keep it cold uh, up to two degrees centigrade for 24 hours or until it is evacuated. We've also invested in uh, uh, milk evacuation tanks and um, vehicles for now. Um, uh, so from time to time, we have people that have been trained that are manning the milk collection centers. Then we have uh, 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 staffs that have been trained who have the competency in um, discussion and understanding the herders because in the collection, um, the men, I think, owns the cattle, but the Fulani woman owns the milk. So every morning, the women milk their cows and uh, take it to the collection point. So we've also started the cash cow thing, where if you bring one liter of milk, you are paid uh, immediately. Uh, though in Kano, milk is more expensive. We are paying over 240, 250, at times 300 liters. By the time you factor in the cost of fueling your vehicle to go 30, 40 kilometers into uh, the settlements to bring it, you find out that your cost will go higher. Um, so these are things uh, uh, we are doing in that area. We've also uh, gone ahead to identify local technicians and we've uh, encouraged them and put them through to begin to manufacture equipment locally instead of having to gather millions or millions to go and import items and you get stuck uh, at the ports. So we've had, we've gotten uh, local partners whom we give specification and they deliver. Virtually as we speak now, uh, most of our milk collection tanks are fabricated locally. And um, I think this has gone uh, to some extent to reduce uh, the cost of uh, production. Uh, L and Z uh, have also uh, gone into um, incentivizing the herders. Uh, what we do now again is we try to talk to the to the herders that you don't need to take all your 300, 400 animals down south during the rains. Just identify the high yield milkers, keep them. Then we have this arrangement where we get concentrates to feed them. And as they bring milk, we equate and we do some arithmetics so that we'll be deducting the cost of concentrate from the milk as they supply. And uh, we also have uh, agronomists, or should I say, 
uh, extension agents that go round to train them on milk hygiene, uh, to train them on some other things. Uh, currently, we have signed uh, an MOU with the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Bayero University. Um, we are building an AI lab for large ruminants and small ruminants uh, alike. Uh, what we're trying to do, we are trying to build the capacity and the competency because we spend actually a lot in importation of semen. So we are trying to build that competency from ground zero, how we can begin to harvest semen from large ruminants and uh, small ruminants so that this semen can be given to um, uh, our farmers, local farmers. And then um, we are also looking at uh, uh, building a small pilot plant for liquid nitrogen. Because these are issues that are very pertinent to the sustainability of uh, dairy in, in Nigeria. So uh, the arrangement with BUK uh, is, is oncoming. We are also uh, building like uh, veterinary field stations. And then we've also identified uh, localities where we are going to build uh, ambulatory uh, services where the vets from BUK and some of our staffs with competency will visit such ambulatory uh, joints be weekly or bi-weekly. When the herders will bring the animals, they will attend to all their needs, uh, baby health, if it is nutrition, bait treatment. Uh, that is also uh, in the making. Um, we have been able to sponsor uh, children of uh, herders to school. And as we speak, I think we have one who is in is 400 level veterinary medicine. And um, what we also do to incentivize is if you send your daughter to school, we'll buy the milk higher so that whatever money you can get, you use that to offset some other cost uh, in sending your child to school. We are providing uh, uniforms, exercise books. Uh, we also employ core members. We, we employ core members, especially to our host community, to make them uh, do their primary service at the primary schools uh, within the community. Uh, we've also known, because of the peculiarity of uh, uh, the, the area we, we do business. Uh, women are not allowed to actually go out and engage in other things. So we are also looking at uh, giving them local chicken that were bred and hatched in our own hatchery uh, to also make them, uh, uh, keep them uh, doing something and uh, getting uh, money. We have also- so, um, uh, I would have to stop you now uh, because we, I think we need to be a bit more time conscious. A round of applause, yes. I, I think you shared a very, very fantastic insight. I still have one more question for this panel, but we we'll have to go around uh, on this first. So let's keep it very brief so that we allow people, other people, to also be able to contribute to the conversation. Please go ahead, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So on the um, on our own backward integration program, there are a number of things we've been able to do. Um, one of them is uh, milk collection. So, so far, we've been able to collect uh, milk from about... Uh, uh, we'll be able to collect roughly about 2,000 liters every day, slightly above that. Um, with the outgrower scheme that we're trying to do right now, we're able to, I think once, uh, sorry, with the smallholder farmer scheme we're also doing, with that, we should be able to provide each farmer with, uh, with an income of about 60,000 Naira every month on the project. And that, what we're doing for them with that project is we're training them, we're feeding the, we're providing feed for the animals. We're also providing veterinary services and training them on how to take care of these animals. I know a lot of people think about um, what we're, sorry, the type of animals we're also giving them, encourage them to have is a crossbreed. I know a lot of people think having exotic is probably the best way to go in terms of milk yield and just having that prestigious animal. But we've, we've had Frisians from the very beginning, we've had Frisians. Um, we still have Frisians on the farm. But I can tell you that the F1s 
look much healthier, much stronger from the moment that they are born. And that's what I would encourage everybody here to try and do. Do the F1s. It cost almost about $3,600 to bring in an animal. Um, that's even by sea, not even by air. F1s cost you nothing. All you need to do is inseminate to the right semen. What are you trying to achieve? Is it beef? Is it milk? What traits do you want for that animal? Do the research, put the right semen, and you get that. These animals come out extremely shiny hair, extremely healthy, extremely active compared to Frasian cows. So I would encourage everyone to do that. Now, um, on the outgrower side, we've so far, when we actually started, we had about a thousand farmers that applied for this scheme. After checking, doing all the necessary checks and so on, only 600 were able to be taken on board. And the reason for that is because most of them did not have BVN and so on and whatever. So they were cut out at the first stage. And even after going on with, to meet CBN SL to go on to the next stage, we still had to cut some of them out because they said, look, how are we sure this say this your, uh, um, what do you call it? Your project is going to work. Let's start out small. Once we prove the concept, then we can now expand the school. So which is why we're on 75 farmers. But even without that, we're also providing facilities with the farm for people that want to invest on their own to come and put their own farms, uh, put their own uh, uh, little smallholder project on the farm to be able to do that. Now, in terms of also holding, Ojo has put me on a high jump. So me too, I need to say some of the PSR that we've been doing. <laughs> So, um, I mean, uh, we are also sponsoring students right from primary school. That's a project where we, we're starting this year. We start from primary school, we take you on, and the idea is that we'll take you all the way to university. If at any time you drop, we start with somebody else again to replace your spot from primary school, taking you all the way to university. And wherever it is that you're able to go, whether it is uh, local or international, we will sponsor that education. We also do books. We've done books to all the schools. We do um, uh, Christmas period. We provide food for the uh, widows within our area. And um, just general, um, uh, should I say, engagement with all of them to make sure with that, with the local community, to make sure that everybody is, um, uh, is, is um, should I say, all interests uh, are covered. Um, I don't want to stay too long. I mean, uh, I can't remember everything, but uh, let me pass it off to the next Thank person. you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So, um, yes, Anthony, quickly. Thank you. So from our end, uh, we are currently, as I mentioned earlier, we are working on our factory in Mina. We intend to rehabilitate or re-innovate two schools and the same local government. We are engaging with local farmers I will not talk a lot on what we are doing because already uh, the other two gentlemen have mentioned uh, similar points. But the point that I'm trying to make is if we look at what my colleagues or other uh, people on the panel have said, I look at it at the, as follows. Uh, challenge equals opportunity. We have an opportunity. As uh, already Mr. Shaheen said, the milk we, we are buying locally anywhere between 200 to 300 naira. And for you to do uh, uh, milk from uh, reconstituted or powder milk, it's going to cost you the same or even more. Uh, also, uh, you are having a healthier product for you and your family, uh, which come at a premium. But when it comes with a premium, it comes also with a wider range of customers because the people who are but the people that are supplying you this milk are your potential customers and they are going to buy if they will not buy the milk from you they will buy the ice cream for instance or they will buy the yogurt from you so even if you are getting the milk locally at a premium price you are going to end up having a larger consumer base because many of the small holders or the widows or the uh, poor families are going to have additional income when you buy milk from them and hence they will go ahead and they will be able and empowered to buy 
milk and milk derivative from your company or any other company here present in Nigeria. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yes, please go ahead. Uh, go ahead with the clap. Okay, please pass it And uh, Madam Winnie, as you as you think about what you to, to, to say, I actually wanted to follow up directly with you on a question uh, around why, you know, how, what, what sort of pol policy uh, or advocacy instrument you think we need to be able to, you know, spur additional private sector investment in this, in this space, uh, because we really need that um, policy would play a very key role in that. So you can add that to the response you want to have. Okay. Um, I think at this point, I will just state what we have available in the department or in the ministry for that are low hanging for private investors or for partners to, to take. And so we in Kwara, Niger, Gombe, Kaduna, Bauchi, and Adamawa, we have meal collection centers in two communities. And these communities have been selected based on their, their volume that they have. And the same community has community feed mill, animal handling center, solar powered boreholes, head dams, in some water harvesting facility in, in others. Some of the farmers have been provided homestead pasture and then there is a five hectare community irrig um, irrigated pasture field for seed production. So we have this in this, we are beckoning on, on um, companies and people who want to um, invest in these communities, um, run these facilities for the benefit of the communities, crowding more um, pastoralists and, and, and encourage a bit of settlement to please um, come to the department and let, let us dialogue on this. Concerning what you asked, um, what I will say is that we, we, you know we have the national dairy policy that we, have, we, we all put together. We need that dairy policy to become operational. A lot of investors are waiting for us to be able to say that the, we create enabling environment for them to operate um, easily. Then we also have within the ministry uh, the opportunity for anybody who wants to go into uh, any form of investment in dairy to work with the other partners that we have. I'll give you an example. I know that L and Z, uh, we've been working with L and Z in the, the way we can. So recently we've started discussing with L and Z on some infrastructure that they might require, some equipment that they might require, and how we can put this within our budget. And we can do this for, if, you, if it's pasture fields, we have a lot of pasture fields all over. So some can leverage on that. So we have a lot of this scattered in the country and we can leverage on this uh, as, as incentive for, for you to, to get into the industry or to expand what you are doing. Um, another aspect that I, I want to talk about, do not related to policy, is the fact that um, we talked about registration of dairy farms. And this is very, very important, very important. And we can only get this done through the processors. Because if you have a dairy farm, that means someone is of either of taking your milk or you are processing. So we will need that data to help us um, also uh, reach out to people who want to, who will benefit from what we have. We have a lot of meal collection centers that are, uh, that need rehabilitation and we are throwing this open for a lot of investors to come in, rehabilitate and, and run it and use it to expand your production. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So I have to pass this on to the computer. Thank you very much, Madam Winnie, for, for the insight. Uh, your last point around data. Uh, and I'll go to my, my last question. DG, you, you would, uh, you will start, I will start with you with this question. Um, you see, we, we're talking a lot about backward integration and, you know, what investment is required to unlock opportunities in this space. And we've heard from these entrepreneurs of what, what, what they are doing and as, as well as what the, 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 minutes, the, the federal government is doing. In the end, it's really about, you know, if backward integration makes economic sense, you know, so it's really around how competitive would of taking milk locally be uh, and what sort of incentives, what sort of interventions, you know, what sort of ideas do we need to really unlock to be able to ensure that milk produced and sourced locally by, you know, these entrepreneurs are actually competitive. Because you know, at the end of the day, you get into the boardroom. What they keep asking you is, you know, what what is what is your you know your total operating cost, and why not consider importing milk? And I think that's where it all starts from. Even with the multinationals who are you know a bit more motivated to 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 go for for the, for, the, for for imported milk. So so Deji, in, in, in your experience, you know, with, with what you've done, even with LNZ and some of the other investments. What, what sort of ideas or incentives do you think is, is really needed to drive economic you know, viability of you know, backward integration in, in the dairy sector in Nigeria? Yeah, thanks, Timmy. Um, that's a very, it's a tough question to answer and, um, uh, and, and tough for many recalls. Um, there are a lot of players and there are a lot of actors you know, in the dairy sector and at the end of the day, one 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 category of people that is usually missing in most of the conversations oh, that we why, have. Because we, we heard him before, but we can't hear him now. Hello, can you hear me? Did you, I think the issue is coming from the room, not, not from your head. So they're trying to okay. screw it up. Maybe we can start with the other uh, panelists while they sort out the technical part. Okay, apologies, Deji. In the interest of time, I think I will go to the other panelists. Uh, then I'll come. I'll come to you. Um, I don't know who wants to go first with this, but we need to really talk about you know what backward integration is, and from your perspectives as you know private companies, uh, how do you see this, and what can we really do to make this a bit more attractive to to pr other private investors who are willing to explore this um, you know this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think uh, backward integration is the way to go. We can see everything that's happening now. Cost of everything is going up. Uh, how sustainable is uh, the importation and the use of powdered milk? Um, less than no time, we're going to be looking at probably 100,000 Naira per bag. That's if we're not close to that already. So that is not the way to go. We need to work on this backward integration. Number one is cheaper. Number two, we need to develop our own country. So if we're going to do that, I think um, one, the right policies have to be in place. Um, I know we worked hard at um, the last meet, uh, conference that we had coming up with a policy that uh, we thought was going to work or somewhere along the line, I don't know, changes were made to it. Um, I don't know if <laughs> we'll still get back to what it was meant to be, but really for us to re achieve what we're trying to do, that policy as it was originally um, put together must be implemented. The first thing we need to do, we need to stop the importation of liquid milk. Anything in liquid form, we can produce it here. It doesn't take anything. Why do we need to bring in milk from Dubai to be sold in our stores here? That's what's being sold. Why do we need to bring yogurt that has a shelf life of one year to be sold on our shelves here? So there's a lot. I mean, 
last time I said a lot during that meeting, I think I made a lot of enemies. I don't know if they're still here today, but I'll still talk about it again today. We're spending 80% of the milk, or if, forgive me if, I'm not get, if I don't get the figures right. 80% of the milk that's been imported into the country is fat food. Fat filled milk is not being consumed in any of these countries. These people that are bringing it in. The fat filled milk is not being sold there. Who's consuming it there? I've never been to any store in the UK, anywhere else, where fat filled milk is being sold. So why are we consuming fat filled, fat -filled milk here like that? But maybe I'll just pass the mic so that I don't uh, over, <laughs> I don't say too much. <laughs> Yeah, uh, initially I, I raised this, po I throw the poser that do you know the milk we consume? I don't know, fat filled milk is milk that the fat content has been removed. After removing it, it is turned into powder. Then you now look for bleach palm kernel oil and you now spray it on it and you ship and send to Africa. That is what we consume, all of us seated here. And we are happy doing so. There are some, they will say slim. All the nutrients have been extracted. They ship it to Africa. We consume and we pay with premium money. They bring to us sterilized milk that all the Amino acids, all the proteins have been denatured. When you heat milk at about 300 degrees centigrade, there's nothing there. And after that, they now enrich it. And they say enrich with 28 minerals and vitamins, with chemicals. And we'll take and we'll give to our children. And when we are long gone, they'll start managing one health issues or the other. We are asked if you go to other climes, they have dispenser for milk, fresh milk. They drop milk at your doorsteps every day. It comes in jars and you put it in your fridge. You consume it within a day. And another one will come. For not wanting to mention names, I've been to the northern part of Friesland where the, the Frisian cows emanated from. A major company there is being owned by cooperative. What they do is what I've just told you. They extract the milk, the fat, and some other things, and push the rest to Nigeria. You think those people will want backward integration to work? And their own farmers will go hungry? It will never work. It is high time we take our destinies in our own hands. Yogurt is being imported to Nigeria from another African company as we speak. And we have cows. Why can't we bring in good semen and breed some of these cows to be dual purpose, dairy and beef? When they are aged and we feel they are no longer giving us milk, we take them to the slaughter. We convert them to beef and we sell. And the farmer is better off because he or she knows that either way is still money. Why can't we begin to look at institutionalizing or in our curriculum, daily technology? When we begin to teach people the intricacies of dairy. Sometimes, some years back, because of the quota system in the EU, some farmers protested. And they opened onto the streets one million liters of milk because you cannot sell more than the quota. A million liters of milk in protest. So powder milk is an avenue for them to ship those milk to us. And because we really don't care with whatever we see, as long as it's well-branded, we eat. So it's high time, we really need the policymakers amongst us should look at these things and do the needful. 
for this country to survive. I can tell you in a little way what we are doing. There's, there's a breed called Aswak. I'm sure uh, Dr. will be Aswak breed. It's a Sahelian cattle. They are highly resistant to uh, drought. So what we did was to bring these things in and we try to inseminate them with uh, Frisian cement. When the calf came out, it was about 20, 25 kg. And if you see these, these uh, Aswak bricks, they are small. The femoral bones are small. So it was a labor uh, parturition. At the end of the day, we lost the calf. So what do we do next? Okay, let's look for a calf that will come out maybe smaller. Okay, let's go for jerseys. So that is currently what we are doing now. So that when we have those F1s from that uh, experiment, we can now take it further to people further away from the town with the hope that these animals will be hardy and they can convert whatever they take and uh, give us milk, no matter how small it is. These are things we are, are doing. Thank you. Uh, you know, just this microphone, when it comes to me, I'll just say microphone again. But I have a few questions to ask. Um, when we say fresh milk and yogurt and powdered milk, I will, I will say that we have more issues around consumption, really. How do we manage consumption of fresh milk in the face of limited power supply? It brings me to technology. How do we look at that technology that will help us preserve? Because the assumption we have now is that when we have fresh milk, people will consume. But what of storage? Because I, I, I want to believe that there are reasons why powdered milk has become so popular. That uh, the people bringing in powdered milk played on our own gaps, our challenges. So how do we do that? And how do we increase awareness on consumption of fresh milk? Because I know that when we say milk, milk, milk in Nigeria, I don't know if I'm correct, but I know that 70 to 80%, if not 90% is yogurt. Yogurt. So what do we do? That's on one side. I don't know. I am looking at technology. I, I, I spoke to um, one of the investors that came from Dubai and I said, it would be nice if you bring us very simple solar powered refrigerators to store the milk, particularly in areas where we have challenges of, of power. That's one. The second one I will ask is, how do we ensure that we really pull together the indigenous uh, producers? The, the, I, don't, I don't like the word looker but the, the, um, the national or, I don't know, key players in the industry. How do we come together? I know Kodaran is there. How well is Kodaran able to pull all of you together to have a strong voice so that we can talk about, we have documents, we have data to push policy. Because you can't push policy without data. Because if you, re if you remember at the, at the national dairy policy uh, discussion, what, there was, what, what was going on is we can't sustain ban on importation or, or increase in tariff. And there are some of us here who were against that tariff that has even been increased and working against even the system to bring it down. And our excuse is that we are not able to 
to uh, fill the gap. So how can we have that data that helps us push for policy to say, before now, 2017, 2016, this is what we were producing. Now, and this was our, our, our supply, this was our demand. Now the supply has increased or has the demand increased? You understand where I'm going? We need that data to push because they seem to have data in their hands that tell us or tell government or powers that be that if you do that, you, are, you won't be able to fill the gap. Who is going to fill the supply gap? That's, what, that's the question. So we need Kodaran to answer that question so that when we know what we are currently producing through your members, and we can say, yes, in 2017, 18, 19, it was this, but with this increased, uh, uh, increase in, in new entrants and in, increased production, increased capacity, uh, uh, within our national players, we have this. So we can match data for data. That's number two. Number three, I would say, is how are we able to um, partner with pastoral organizations? How can Coderan and pastoral organizations come together and and ensure that we are able to collect enough milk from the very many uh, uh, liters of milk that we are currently wasting. We are currently wasting. You go to Taraba, we are currently wasting milk. So how can we ensure that these pastoralists are taught the right way to collect and we have strategically located collection centers to pick this milk. These are all the things we need to. And then finally is the issue around pasture, feed for these animals. So as we want to increase and meet our national demand, we need to pay particular attention to feed. As a country, we are still, we've not seen that uh, feed industry as important as it should be. And so while yes, we are trying to push for national pastoral development program where we partner with so many, so many organizations, we need to see people who are specialized. This person does nothing other than produce feed, produce uh, a feed for cattle or for, for ruminants. This person does nothing, specializes in just collection so that the people who are processing can reduce their, their, their cost of, of processing and then it becomes affordable and available to those that will want to purchase it. I'll stop here, thank you. Hello once again. Uh, I think the other panelists have answered most of the question. In my opinion, I truly believe that, again, same as most of us have already said it, we need a clear national dairy policy with a clean time frame. I think that, again, based on what we have seen today and based on what we have discussed, in terms of cost and in terms of availability, things start to make sense. In terms of initiative, I think members are taking more than enough initiative to improve on the dairy sector. Behind now is investment. And how do we attract investors is by timeline uh, national dairy policy say uh, so that the investors can know that the current modalities of the dairy consumption in Nigeria are going to change. And this is their opportunity to invest in dairy businesses or uh, related businesses to dairy, such as equipment or feeding uh, or uh, related sectors so that they can make good money. And this can only come through when we have a clear policy. And I believe that we, should, we are ready for it uh, currently. I know that maybe Cheyenne is very keen on the initial plan of the dairy policy. I believe that that's, that's an ideal solution. But again, for us to have a clear dairy policy, even if it's not ideal for us as a starting point, we can, again, I believe we can still improve on it. 
But uh, to be honest, although may, I don't want to make the same enemies that she did, uh, the man is saying uh, something that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to these amazing panelists. Uh, do we have Deji on now? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Nah, you can't hear me. So pl please, please, if you're online and you you want to share your share your thoughts, please share via the chat box. We won't be able to take comments online. Uh, can can we put Deji on? to share his thoughts before I open up uh, this for about 10, 10 more minutes to discuss uh, with the participants in the room. Deji, please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, great. So um, what I was going to say initially was that uh, one of the one of the sets of people that we, you know, in this conversation that we have not always looked at are actually the consumers of these products. There is the health benefit. I think um, um, Paul has talked extensively about that. There's the health benefits. There are the, there's the financial benefit as well to the consumers in terms of whatever they have been um, given. But, but I think we need to look at the picture holistically in the sense that backwards integration is, is ultimately the way to go. I think the question we are all trying to answer is how do we get there? Now, there are proponents for let's do it now. There are, uh, you know, and there are propositions for let's build out the journey. How do we get there? And I think the conversation we should be having should really be on, on, more on the second point, because I think we all agree that all the infrastructures, all the, the based on demand supply, everything that is required to get to that destination is not fully fitted now. But we need to be having serious conversations, which I'm not sure is happening. Serious conversations on what needs to be. And I think it's speaking to some of the um, things that Anthony is talking about when he talks about having a clear policy on timelines. What do we need to do? What must be in place? Um, what volume of milk must we be producing? And even to produce those milks, what are the incentives in place You know, to make sure that those things are being done and being encouraged? Uh, because if for if today if local processors and producers are being discouraged in any way through the kind of policies that we have in place, then that journey is not going to it's not going to materialize. It's not going to happen. So we need to even be sure that the local processors that are you know putting a stake on the floor on the ground today to move in that direction are being incentivized you know to do more. But then we also need to make sure that those who are not are also seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that this is something that must happen. But the reality is that backwards integration, like every other sector, really, especially like, um, you know, um, we are saying that milk is being wasted, it's being thrown away. There's a lot of milk potential in the country that we have a large herd size that we can unnest. You know, the opportunity is there, but it's how to pull all this together. And I think our conversation, if, if we focus on that conversation, I think that is what is going to bring us closer to um, where we want to be. In terms of in terms of backwards integration, but I agree that backwards integration ultimately is what is ultimately where we need to be. Thank you very much, Daisy. Uh, thanks so much for your contributions. Uh, do we have comments and questions in the room? Okay. I'll be here with this mic, and um, okay. we'll start. Also. And then I can see a second hand way. up. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, the moderator. And I want to thank all the panelists for doing justice to the topic. My question is this. Will we achieve this strategic, I mean, catalyzing milk revolution in Nigeria, true strategic investment in daily development, going only by backward integration, will we achieve anything? How long will it take us? I don't think so. I think this, um, is it the Ethiopian and Kenya model that was discussed, should proceed simultaneously. While we keep upgrading, uplifting, upscaling the pastoralist operations, we need to look at large scale operations, investment, 20,000 dairy milking cows operation. You're looking at um, somebody says somewhere that look, 
How can you change a culture of 1,000 years? But we, I, we know in Nigeria, we have been making steady progress, sedentarizing the pastoralists. But look at their total operations, the various uh, small, small challenges that we are mitigating in, you know, in mail collection and all. We know there are challenges for that. But looking at what we need, how long will it take us to get to be self-sufficient in milk through backward integration? Why will those companies not go into large-scale operations? 50,000 dairy hard that will produce you know, a, a large quantum of milk. I think that is the way we should go. And I think we should take a cue from the poultry industry, even in doing that, because we will say, yes, we have agreed to do that. The next question, is it possible? Is it going to be economically feasible? The director of animal husbandry services talked about data. And um, the, I mean, Dr. Shoyombo also spoke about some challenges in terms of data collection, data management, and so, which is not yet. Have we budgeted now for data banking and all those data issues for 2023 federal budget? If it's not the end, then we are talking of 2024 to even start. And we know the process of government procedure, I mean, in uh, getting approvals. So, and we are in a hurry. We are saying, hey, we want to ban uh, importation and so on. What of, already we are even stimulating demand, increasing consumption for the 40% that we are producing. So if the other one was not even there and there's even higher demand, what will be the consequence? So what I'm saying is in the poultry sector, we started by importation of exotic breeds. Government did that with the plan that it will be turned over to the private sector. Now, all the eggs, all the poultry meat we are consuming, are they indigenous Nigerian chickens? The answer is no. I am a member of Poultry Association of Nigeria. In fact, a foundation member. The answer is no. All our chickens are exotic breeds as of today, but we are self-sufficient in, egg, in eggs and in poultry meat. To the extent that there is no year we do not suffer bouts of egg gloves. What I'm prescribing and I'm going to ask the director is, will it not be feasible and sensible for us to invite foreign companies who will come in with large scale operations? in Nigeria and import live animals. You know it will take time in breeding as we are doing. And from what has been imported, we now do crossing and back crossings to build up local stock. That was what was done in the poultry sector from 1957 to date. Thank you, Dr. Edige. Thank I you very much. Stop you. Um, so I, I think, Shane, uh, you have... Let me answer one part of your question. And I did this calculation, um, I think was it two years ago when this whole thing started. Let's assume we're looking at Frasian cows. We only need 600,000 cows to completely satisfy the milk yield. So basically what I did was I worked backwards. How much is it that we're spending on uh, importation of powdered milk. Converted that quantity of powdered milk into liquid milk, and then looked what the looked at what the average um, yield of a Frisian cow is, and that gave me six hundred thousand animals. If we're looking at uh, F ones or whatever, maybe we multiplied by two giving you uh, one, maybe 1.2 million animals. This is doable, extremely doable. So I agree with you, sir. Um, what do you call it? Uh, backward integration is not enough. Policy also needs to be there. But at the same time, it is also easy to jump the gun and say, this is how we want to do it. All of us in this room, for instance, come together, form a company, have investment in that 600,000 animals, 
have a huge farm somewhere. Maybe it's made one farm, maybe it's two units somewhere with 600,000 animals. There are farms, I think, in, uh, in uh, Dubai, so is it in Saudi and so on, that have more animals than that on their farm. And overnight, that can be solved. But then there are also the um, negative parts too of having Frisian animals, which is why there will be a bit more time needed. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, um, you know, this question you asked is, um, I think it's, I would say it's easier said than done. Why do I say that? I was in Egypt deliberately to go and see why, what the problems could be, why we are not getting where we should be. And I visited the non farm the non-factory, the non-supplies is only two major suppliers of milk and dairy products in Egypt, two major, the non and another company. This same the non had only 300 Frisian cows, 300. And then he had it, it had livestock service centers in three locations. For one of the locations we visited, they had 8,000 cows, but they were being held by cooperatives. So Danone was providing health, government was providing health services. There was a vet clinic there, and there was partnership on feed. Okay, so they told me that they are collecting 20% of the milk they need from their own 300 cows and collecting 80% from these 8,000 cows. So they, are, they help the cooperatives to improve their breeds and they also help them with um, other services. The point here is that the handling cost of an, of an animal is so high, it's so high. And these are people who need just very little training and they will do what they are doing now better. And you can provide them with other services and you collect their milk cheaper for you. And then you, can, you, you, you are also, you are also um, creating jobs because if you put Somebody, um, Dr. Edigi, somebody came from, one company came from Dubai to the office. He wants to open a very large dairy farm in Kano. And this is his plan. He wants to have 1,000 Frisian bull, um, cows and another 20,000 in the hands of cooperatives. So it's going to put the processing facility that can take on those. So I asked him a question. Why don't you have 20,000 uh, cows? The man smiled and said, Madam, the handling cost of one animal will be too high. And what will be producing, nobody can buy. So we need to look at how Kenya got to where they are. Kenya started like this. Yes, the only difference is that it was not completely in the hands of the Maasai. It was in the hands of you and I. And so we have one or two cows behind our back. And there were, co there, there were companies that were going around collecting as we put in front. Kenya model and India model, the same. So it's very, very difficult if you ask even uh, Promacido or uh, Danone fan mail, what they are going through now in the ones that they've imported, they will tell you more. So it's really, really difficult to do that. No, from there. That's how, that, that's how Kano Dairy started. There's Kano Dairy today. And people, Kano Dairy started with one main collection center that was provided by FMAD. And we provided another one. And then we gave them some vehicles and we gave them some uh, into the same thing. They decided and they bought their 50 hectares. 
and they are settling. Now infrastructure is going to them. That's the way we will go. But you know what? We have not documenting it, which is what I said. I've mentioned two, three, four, no concerted effort to document it. So we beckon on private, private um, practitioners, private companies to please come partner with us. Let's document these things. Let's showcase it. Let's go to the field and see. Nigeria is being looked at as a model by the coastal countries, what we are doing. So I think we are on the right path. The only thing is organizing it and making sure we are documenting. And as we move on, I tell you, before you know it, these 600,000 will be, but not by two, three, four companies. It can be by like 50 companies. And will we get there? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. We will need to move. Uh, sorry, Anthony. Uh, let's go to the next question. We don't have any more time left. Uh, please uh, go straight to the point. Well, right. Start by introducing yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chidike, and I'm a research scientist with the National Biotechnology Development Agency. So in my own view, it seems like there is a disconnect between the key players in the dairy industry and the research and educational institutions, because as a business in the life science industry, your business model has to be based on you know, quantitative research. So my question is, what are the key players in this industry doing to bridge this gap between our educational facilities where we are training you know, graduates in, in animal science and, and animal husbandry? What are the key players doing to bridge this gap so that we can have at least qualified individuals in the system that are bringing in ideas and innovations that are based on sound research? And also, I want to know what the role technology is playing as key players in the industry. What role is technology playing in the dairy industry in terms of using artificial intelligence, big data, and biotechnology to shape the dairy industry? And my last question is on... Sorry, let, let, let's take just two of your questions. Oh, We're really okay. out of time. Right. Thank, thank you very much. Now, let's see how we can round up everything. Yes, so I, I think that will probably be our last question, but I think we've touched on you know, several other areas that many other people might, might be willing to speak to. I know Mr. Shea needs to run now because he needs to catch up with a flight. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, let's not delay you further so you don't, you don't miss the flight. Thank you very much. But in response to your questions, I don't know if other members of the panel are willing to take a stab at responding to that question. And I know we also have uh, Professor Yai in, 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 the, in the room. Uh, we have quite a number of our experts from the institutes and, 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 and universities to also do justice to that question. Um, I know there are quite a number of programs that the private sector is currently, you know, leading uh, in collaboration with NVRI, for example, with NIAS, for example. You know, so there are quite a number of things that are going on. Maybe they're not enough. We need to do a bit more, you know, to make to make sure that we really tap into that world of knowledge and experience within uh, the the academics uh, as well as you know all other associations that will support what we're doing. But I, I can assure you there are quite a number of you know things that are going on. I mean, from where I'm sitting with the implementation of the, of the Audin program, there are quite a number of partnerships and collaboration opportunities that we're exploring, even with you know NAPRI. Uh, so I, I can assure you that. And when you, you talk about the role of technology, uh, I think technology is playing some roles, uh, definitely. You would also agree with me that our dairy sector is quite young at the moment. We are it's it's still nascent. Uh, there are quite a number of things we're trying to, we're really trying out. Models we're trying to prove, you know, concepts we're trying to prove. So until when we get to that point where we've actually proved out all those models and we're really comfortable with what model we really want to, you know, explore that we'll call the Nigeria model to unlocking, you know, opportunities within the local dairy sector. At that point, we may not be able to use a lot of technology to drive, you know, the conversation. For instance, we were talking about collaborating with the small order producers and making sure that you know we can leverage you know what they are doing to increase milk production. Um, you know, uh, technology. You know, ideas we could de deploy to that. But maybe one of those would probably be the use of AI 
uh, which several organizations, even represented on this uh, panel, are currently trying out to see what's possible. We're also currently talking about, you know, developing a commercial feed and food uh, or pasture, you know, development sector. And I was just discussing with my team recently that why don't we have an application that, you know, helps uh, a, an investor be able to just plug in a few numbers to say, you know, uh, if you are raising 10 or, or 50 cows, this is how much money you're going to have to invest before you get this cow to, you know, slaughter weight or before you, you get to the point where you, you start to uptake milk. You know, in terms of all of the you know various services, you know, you can plug in some some numbers and it will generate that for you. So there are quite a number of ideas that we have within the private sector, as well as you know within the public sector that we're, we're trying we're trying out. But like I said, understanding the model that works for us and pushing that model, scaling it uh, at this stage of our development is very critical to achieving you know sufficiency. I know. Um, the MC is really, you know, me. We really need to end this panel discussions. Okay, Madam Winnie, okay, go ahead quickly. Hand off in uh, two minutes. Yeah, there's one, just one point before we end, and that is re we ne really need to also consider, and that is security. We've we've not said anything about it, because a lot of people who like to to to, to um, go into the, the uh, this invest in the dairy uh, sector most of the time lose their investments because we don't have look at what's happening in Niger so it's another thing that we need to look at and consider as we go on we are not praying it to live for with us forever but it's one of the major challenges we face right now thank you Thank you very much, Madam Winnie. And uh, in closing this session, I would like to just quickly run through some of the key takeaways that I that I noted, and I'm very sure that these ones and you know some of the other you know key insights that have been shared uh, with a very excellent panelists will be captured in the communique uh, for, for this conference. But some of the things I noted here is uh, the need for us to increase advocacy, maybe uh, policy environment that support a thriving dairy. Uh, sector, the need to continue uh, to build the capacity of key actors within the dairy ecosystem uh, as they implement dairy business models uh, rooted in backward integration. And the need for increased investments across the various aspects of the dairy value chain to improve mixed supply. Also, we spoke a lot about uh, the need for data. We said we need data for appropriate planning and for developing tailored and, and targeted interventions. Uh, we need to be able to relate with the small farmers and build a capacity to increase their knowledge and achieve best practices and quality. Uh, there's a need for us to manage the consumption of fresh milk, especially in the face of limited you know, power availability in the country. Uh, and Dr. I think Madam Winnie talked about uh, coming up with some sort of innovative approaches to refrigeration. Uh, there's a need for us to increase awareness around consumption of fresh milk in Nigeria. Uh, the national dairy policy, I think Shane spoke a lot about that, and the need for us to make sure that that original document that you know all the all, all the critical actors in the in the sector um, you know made input to be released and you know uh, implemented in earnest. Thirty seconds. The last one that I would like to, to mention is you know creating an ecosystem, a vibrant ecosystem of key actors within within this dairy uh, you know landscape. Where I mean, leading this will probably will be Kodaran, you know, working and identifying, uh, working with and identifying other actors within this space to really build a, a coercive force uh, that could lead, you know, policy advocacy that could lead this awareness that we all are yearning for. Um, on that note, I would like to say a big thank you to all the panelists. The Jadi Busi, thank you very much. Uh, I know we had technology issues, but we we we, we enjoyed uh, some of the insight that you shared. Thank you so much, uh, Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Winnie. I say big thank you. Please a round of applause to these people. Uh, Ojo, thank you, and Shane uh, Absentia. Thank you so much. And lastly, please, uh, some of our online participants unfortunately were unable to take comment from you, and I know that many of them have already dropped in their. Uh, perspectives, their, their insights in the chat box. So please, let's make sure that we export those charts 
and print them out uh, for us to feed them into the community. Thank you so much. I hand over now. Thank you very much. But please put your hands together one more time for the panelists. Please, I will crave your indulgence. Please do remain on the stage. One minute, <laughs> just for one minute. You've been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful participant today. It's not easy to be here from morning till this time. Please put your hands together for yourself one more time. Thank you so much for your patience. to present the awards to some of the panelists. Please put your hands together for him as a come a very gentle looking man. I'm sure he can't hurt a fly. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So I'll call on Mrs. Winnie Lai Sholarin for her award. Okay, Mrs. Christy Onyebule, can you join her on stage, please? Okay, she's here. Put your hands together for her. Up next on the list is Mr. Shane Shekari. I think he, he left a while back. Okay. Uh, Mr. Anthony Alkosaif. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Paul Ojo for MD Abubakar. Please get ready. Next on the list is Mr. Deji Adebusoye receiving it on his behalf. Pisae Okayode. Is he here? Or she? Is she here? Okay, she's coming. While she's receiving for Mr. Deji Adebusoye, Mr. Temi Adegoye of Sahel Consulting should also get ready. Keep the applause coming, please. Keep it coming. Next is Mr. Temi Adegoye of Sahel Consulting. We'd like to appreciate our partners and sponsors, Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. That will be all for the awards. Integrated Dairies Limited, LNZ, Delhi Frost, Raw Material Research Development Council of Nigeria. We thank you and we appreciate you. Um, not to worry, we have just two items left. We'll be taking just two from the program. We'll be taking interacting and feedback sessions with the Nigerian Institute of Animal Science. We'll be taking that. And then the breakout sessions, which will be very, 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 very short. Those are those the two items we'll be taking. So I'd like to call to the podium, please, my panelists, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Please go back to your seats now. Thank you. Please make welcome. Mr. Fitzborn Ekpo, 
Deputy Director, Institute of Animal Science, Abuja. He will be the one to take charge of the interactive and feedback session. Mr. Fitzborn Ekbo, please. He's coming, he's coming. Put your hands together for him. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Vixi Bonepo. I to present on this interactive and feedback session. I want to call on the registrar of the Institute, Professor Isis A. Yeye, to please come up to the podium. Okay. Please come and put our hands together as it comes up. You're welcome, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to, on behalf of the Institute, congratulate Coderan. Uh, very good partners who work together with them and also uh, with Sahel Consulting. We are working out some very good programs as at now. I'm not going to take too much of your time because I know there are other papers uh, coming up, but I'm here just to let you know that uh, all the things we've been talking about since morning up to now, they are very important. They touch the soul of uh, meat production in Nigeria and the need for us to be self-sufficient in American dairy products in this country. We've heard and seen a lot of data being thrown, thrown at us. And of course, we know that uh, 1.5 billion we spend on importation is money that is just going to other countries. We need to stem, we need to stem that tide. And the Nigerian Institute of Animal Science uh, it's a regulatory agency in the Ministry of Agriculture. And what we do is simply to, as established by law, is to bring about um, certain programs that can help to upscale the businesses of our operators. So as we adopt a friendly uh, model to help operators to sustain their businesses, and then contribute positive, positively to the economy. And um, as regulators, we have clear mandates uh, for our own members who are very key in what we do in the industry as well as in government. Somebody asked just now, what uh, are we doing about the graduates that are being turned out in the Department of Animal Science who are going to be involved in animal husbandry services across the value chains in the country? That's a very good question. And that's what, that is what we stand for. We regulate what goes on in the Department of Animal Science with respect to the personnel that are handling our students and also with respect to the facilities that are available to them. And for that, we have been quite successful and I can tell you that um, we have carried out resource verifications in nothing less than 50 to 55 departments of animal science in this country. And that is to help to ensure that the graduates we, we, we do produce are people that we can uh, uh, boast of that we be able to help the industry to move forward. But when we actually believe that a great impact can be made is the mandate to also regulate the livestock industry. And this is where we are making friends with Corderan, with uh, other bodies that are involved in direct operations. 
And I say, as I stand right here, we've been quite successful in the feed industry and in bringing out regulations that simply help to um, tell the operators, look, this is the way to do it according to best practices. We've had regulations in the feed mill industry, which has been able to help us have a preview of what is happening there and how best to do it according to practice regulation that we also have. And in this regard, we work with sister agencies. We work with NAVDAG. We look at the practice side of feed milling, and then they look at the product side of uh, the feed uh, sector. And then we also have regulation for the breeder farms for poultry, uh, for, for, for hatchery, for DOG marketing, as we, we have been able to organize this. And what we say is we need to actually collaborate with those who are directly involved in order to be able to bring out regulations and guidelines that will help their businesses further. And that's what the Institute does. Also right now, we have perfected or we are perfecting the regulation for other sectors like the abattoir and the poultry dance stream, which is also quite dear to us. And then we are now facing the dairy sector. And this is why when this conference was coming up, behind the scene, we have had discussions with um, L and Z and other firms like that. And we said, look, what we do in here is we like to know the challenges. We like to know the problems, what they are facing and so on and so forth. And then on the basis of that, we do cooperate and we bring our regulations that can help to find solutions to these uh, challenges. And we had this morning, uh, the, the, the dairy policy. Well, we have it in draft or it's been actually validated, but still there are question marks. And as regulators, we are interested because we need to protect the interest of the operators. If their interest is not protected, then the industry is, is going to die. What well, their businesses will suffer and the industry will eventually collapse. And that's not what we want. So we stand as regulators to collaborate with them, to help them and to model their businesses in such a way that they can contribute effectively to the national economy. It's working in the feed industry, it's working in the poultry industry for us. And if you look at it, the poultry subsector is the, about the most organized sector that we have in the livestock, uh, subsector that we have in the livestock sector. We want to push this to dairy, to sheep and goat, to swine, to leather, and several other areas that we believe that the country can benefit from. That is what the Institute stands for. That is what we do. And we are also pushing what we call innovation platforms. Because a lot of questions are coming up. If you detect what is wrong on your farm, how best would you be able to find a solution to it if it's a technical problem? So the Institute is there. We are creating innovation platform by which we can link uh, industry with uh, research uh, experts and then make it that whatever research you are doing should be industry driven. We also create innovation platform that will make it that whatever policy that is coming out um, powered by the government on, on this side, as we just said, like the, the Department of Animal Husbandry Services, it should also be uh, demand driven from the industry. We create this platform and we are ready to deploy it and activate it in the case of uh, the dairy subsector. And what are the benefits? The huge benefits accrue to the farmers, to the traders, to food processors, and also to the research stations, because then the research is more focused and of more uh, benefit to the industry. 
And then, of course, government officials. Now, we have a model in NEARS in our regulation. And the model is to involve all stakeholders. Before a regulation comes out, we draw experts from different fields. And that's exactly what we are going to do in the case of the dairy uh, industry. We draw experts from the different uh, sectors and we bring them together, look at the zero draft, and then we begin to look at it, how it's going to benefit each of the subsectors and units. And then it goes to stakeholders. The stakeholders look at it again, and then it goes for validation, and then it goes for legal drafting because the Federal Ministry of Justice has to look at it and put it in a perfect legal language. And then it comes out as a law, not to um, punish, but to help the business to grow. So this is the model that we have, and this is what we are going to be doing with Coderan and other interested uh, bodies that will help us to mitigating, I mean, uh, that are affecting the, the production of milk or availability of it. They are mitigated as a nation so that our people can have enough milk. And we can also have probably come to a point where we have to have milk for export. I don't think it is impossible. And that's what we look at in the Institute. How do we turn things around? How do we turn the current situation around, the challenges, what are the opportunities there that we can help our printers to build so that we move from make importers to make exporters. And so we are here, the Institute is here. If we have questions, we are ready to take them and then um, we can all work together for a better country. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Echo, we take the, the rest part of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Another round of applause, please. Thank you very much. We've heard about an innovative platform, an interactive platform where all of us the researchers, the stakeholders, be it in the business sector or the dairy sector, the farmers can come together and then interact over time. Because over the years, we've been having this kind of forum. You know, and after the program, everyone goes back to his or her business or home. We don't interact after that. So we come up with this interactive um, session, or let me say platform, or innovative platform, where we can interact after this meeting. So as we are seated, please, the form will be sent across to you. Just fill your name, your email, contact point, so that we can, after this forum, we can interact further. Thank you. But before I leave, I said two minutes. I've just spent one minute. So the second thing I want to do, I want to give us some questions so that as we go back, we ponder over it and see the outcome of it. Okay. Number one, how is each stage of dairy value chain reaching to industry and regulatory pressures? How are they reacting? So let me repeat that. How is each stage of the dairy value chain reacting to A, industry and regulatory pressures, B, to technical innovations, C, to environmental pressures? How are they reacting? Two, which part of the industry will struggle to meet sustainability and environmental targets? Three, how is the industry reacting to consumer trends? which are consumer preferences for healthier products and clean label leading us. Four, which changes in the value chain will e-commerce lead to? Five, 
are there expanding upon food process of technologies, processes, and ingredients will be acceptable to government regulators? Thank you. Let's ponder over these questions. As we go back, and as you drop your contacts, we will be interacting. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you very much. I sessions. We have three breakout sessions. We'll take our confirmed time, probably will take just 30 or 20 minutes for the discussions and the breakout sessions. After that, I'll bid you farewell. We have three sessions. One is investment opportunities in animal feed commercialization in the Nigerian dairy sector. The anchor of that group will be Mr. Paul Ojo. Now, you will pick the topic that best interests you. We are not grouping you into groups. You know what interests you, what tickles your fancy in this sector. So you will pick the topic. If you go through your program, you, it's all there in the program. So you can go through it over and over again and think of the one that best suits you. We have group one over here. Group two will be over there by my right. Am I right? And group three will be by my left down there. If you, if you, look, if you look behind you, you have two more uh, boards over there, screens behind. So group one, two, and three will be there. Group one, like I said earlier, is investment opportunities in animal feed commercialization in the Nigerian dairy sector. The anchor of that group is Mr. Paul Ojo. Group two is unlocking wealth creation creation opportunities in rural communities through financial inclusion. The anchor of that group is Mr. Olushola Obikanye. He's a group head, Agri-Finance and Solid Minerals, Sterling Bank. So if you like to follow bankers thinking they will drop money or they have money, that's your group. Group three is food safety, understanding nutrition facts labels on dairy products by the anchor of that group is Dr. Tunde Shigbeku. Shigbeku, I hope I got that right, Shigbeku. He's the Deputy Director, Head of Animal Feed and Premix Division of NAVDAC. Please, if you are, okay, Mr. Paul Ojo. Okay, Mr. Paul Ojo is there, is the anchor for group one. That's your group there. You use the screen. Group two is Mr. Olushola Obikanye. Mr. Olushola, Mr. Obikanye, please. Okay, he's here. So he's for group two, and group two is there. That screen behind, to the right. Group three is food safety, understanding nutrition facts labels on dairy products. Anchored by Mr. Tunde Shigbeku. Okay. Okay. Are we okay now? Good. Okay, um, Miss Ojo, to the apply, I think I'll, I'll, I'll allocate this, this, the whole people, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Can I get your attention, please? This table, that table, that one, and this one. Group one, you go with Mr. Ojo. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. One, two, three, four. We are for group one. From this middle,
can all of us from this group, from this point, join group three, please. From this point, we'll go down to group three, please. Sir. Hmm? Which one do you want? What group do you want? I know you're tired, but just lend me one more. I don't say what. But... Um... Nigeria, you can like Monisha or lock you well, see crowd. Why are we like this? <laughs> Imagine the entire hall wants to unlock wealth in the dairy sector. Interesting. Are you here? Okay, please move um, that way. Move forward, please. If you are in group with uh, Dr. Mr. Ojo, please move forward. Okay, okay. Good. So you can move forward. Say any of these seats, one, two, three, four, is for that group. Um, Mr. Joe. Okay. Oh, your voice will not disturb others. But if to be nice, if you can stand here while you talk without the mic. Huh? Okay, yes, if you do that, you may stop. Um, okay, for your group, yeah, just a little bit Ooh. because of the crap, it looks out quite okay. Let me try and move you guys close together so that you don't know that. No, I'm coming down there. Now. Yeah, it will disturb others, definitely. So, please, if you can just stay in the middle so that everybody here can hear you, it will be safer for others. We call the vulnerable groups want to go in on Shola Obikanye and Dr. Tunde Shibeku. Come on stage for the awards when they are done with their group. So Lulope Babajide will be standing in for Mr. Obikanye. She'll be standing in for Mr. Olushola Obikanye. After the presentation of our words to the anchors,
Mr. Dien Abasi Akpanyang will be giving us the closing remark after the presentation of the awards to the anchors. Looks like group one is done too. Looks like we don't want to go again. I talk for a living. After the closing remark by Mr. Apeyang, on your way out, lunch is ready. Oh, well, dinner now. <laughs> Put your hands together for yourself. Miss Tolu Babajide, please come on stage and receive the award on behalf of Mr. Tunde Obikanye. Olushala will be kind, sorry. I would like to call on Mrs. Christy Onyebule to present the awards. Hold on. <laughs> So look, Baba Jide receiving the award on behalf of Mr. Olushola Obikanye, Group Head, Agri Finance and Solid Minerals, Sterling Bank. Okay, Dr. Tunde Shibeku. Dr. Tunde Shigbeku is the Deputy Director, Head of Animal Feed and Prem Mix Division, NAVDAC. National Agency for Food and Drug. Mr. Tunde Shibeku, <laughs> well done, sir. It is well with you. <laughs> Dr. Tunde Shibeku is the Deputy Director, 
head of animal feed and premix division, NAVDAC, National Agency for Food and Drug Control. Thank you. That will be all for the awards. I'll be handing over, handing the mic over to Mr. Diana Abasi, Diana Abasi, for his uh, closing remark. Good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I know uh, food is served, and um, we've had our lunch kept since three o'clock. And um, before it gets cold. I want to say thank you to all of us for staying from morning till now. Thank you to our facilitators. They have been excellent. Thank you to the panelists and everyone who has made a presentation here today. Thank you to our MC who has done a very fantastic job. Thank you so much. Please, before we leave, let's have lunch. Please ensure that you have lunch before you leave. Thank you for coming and God bless you all. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful hosting you for today. Before I say good night, my name remains Rita Ene Okwanihe. But if you want discounts, you can call me Ene. That's my mumu button. <laughs>